<laughs> oh, look at Coach Tyler. He's got he's got arms full going over there. <laughs> where's where's the third one, Tyler? In the bathroom, he just <laughs> a disaster. Hi. Oh, boys, uh, Tyler. Yeah. Oh, three, yeah, three boys, three under four or three under five. So chaos. Yes, yes. Five. Boy, I thought I was bad. I got four girls. This chaos. Yeah. I got five kids, and but their youngest is twenty-two. <laughs> not the same as Tyler. Uh, well, I'm not going to say how old my youngest is. A lot more than twenty. A lot more than twenty. I got grandchildren more than twenty-two. <laughs> oh, that's a happy day. <clears throat> you ready to roll, Paul? We are good to go, sir. You got the no, intro. Right. All righty. So I'll throw it back to you in a second here, Paul, to introduce our first presenter. But yeah, welcome back to Wednesday night. It's, uh, as we just talked there, 30 degrees here in Ontario today. So we're getting closer and closer to summer and hopefully opening back up to some real football and stuff like that. So tonight we've got a couple of gentlemen who are going to talk about uh, quarterback play and stuff like that. So Paul, do you want to introduce our first presenter? Absolutely. So uh, first coach we got up is uh, Danny Freund. Danny was a player at UND when I was there. Uh, he was a quarterback. He's one of those guys that uh, just wouldn't get outworked, you know what I mean? So guys had the utmost respect for him as a player, and I'm sure it's exactly the same way as a coach because uh, Dan he's just one of those guys that just, he just leads just by example. Uh, so Danny's now the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at University of North Dakota. They just wrapped up their season with the, uh, the whole change with the, uh, the, the spring season this year. Uh, they had a good run in the playoffs, had a great season. And uh, I'll kick it over to you, Danny. You got it. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. I uh, look forward to this. And uh, I'm just going to switch my screen over here. Got a quick PowerPoint and then uh, just wanted to watch some video. So hopefully the stream goes all right with the video and just share some drills that we use, some everyday drills, some stuff that we might not do every day, but I feel like translates over to um, – to the game because the drills that you run, you always want them to show up in the game because that's kind of, that's what becomes the game, uh, the things you do during practice. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah, thank coach Sharps for having me on and uh, hopefully you guys can get something out of this. And if there's questions, feel free to like, I don't know, ask them, just jump in or, or write them in the chat. However, this works. I've been on this a few times, but not by no means am I an expert. i um, just going to go through a quick PowerPoint here. Um, let me know if you can, can you guys see that? Yeah, we got it. Okay, I just wanted to show this slide, or about four slides quick, and then um, kind of move on to the, to the video. Um, see if I can make this big up in the, uh, it's all right. We'll just, we'll just kind of go through it with, on here though. Just, I wanted to show some of the things that we look for when we're looking for quarterbacks. Um, and it, it might be the same at, at your school or um, university kind of just what we look for, what we think is important about the position. I, I know that I was on the one a couple of weeks ago, you know, talking through um, just the, the quarterback questions and there's a lot of great discussion on that. But the first thing we look for is just competitiveness and leadership. I think uh, kids that play multiple sports end up being really good quarterbacks. So we, we like guys that play multiple sports as long as they possibly can before they have to, you know, push it over and do one. Um, and then just winners and productive guys. We don't have to go through all this, but I think accuracy is another one that um, it can be taught, but it's something you really want to look for, especially uh, guys that can make accurate throws from different positions. And that's something we really work a lot on in practice because the way the game's going, I feel like the defensive linemen are, are more athletic than the offensive linemen and the discrepancies kind of continue to get bigger. Um, so just accuracy from different positions and then accuracy on, on deeper passes. Uh, that's a little bit harder to teach in my mind. Um, it's more natural. And then um, just the athleticism part of having quick feet, quick arm, um, just a natural throwing motion. You know, they're not, not all going to look the same, but um, guys that have quick feet and, and 
are able to, you know, get those things in position to make throws and, and escape the pocket and get out. I think that's, that's really important and guys that do it in different ways, but athleticism is a kind of becoming a key, key component of kind of the modern game. And I think that's, that's something that we really look for. Um, as we go through the drills, I think there's a couple slides here. I just wanted to, just some names for the drills and I can send you any of this and I know it's getting recorded too. So that's, that's good. Um, but just, we'll just some warm up drills where we're kind of just dropping on a line, working our feet. Um, some drills where we're, we're using agile bags, um, to, to work on our base, um, rotation, just to work on our feet. And, and then, um, the last kind of, mm -hmm. kind of that's the most important would just be reactionary drills. That's kind of way the game is played. Um, so just training things that that might happen in a game or situations that, that do show up and just being able to, to go through those. So I just wanted to show those quick slides really quick and then just kind of get to the video. And um, sorry, I might have went away there. Um, how do I stop sharing the screen? New share. Yeah. All right. Are you guys able to see that? The video. Yep. Now we got it. Okay. Excellent. So that's what I'm seeing too. I don't know if I'm supposed to, I'm just going to watch the video. I can't really see your faces, but that's, that's okay. Um, so just holler if you have questions and, and we'll kind of go through this and um, just present some stuff that I think is important and, and what we work on and then maybe some questions at the end, but this is just a, a warm up drill. We're just dropping on a line. Um, nothing revolutionary. All these things are, are things that other people have done, but um, just as a quick warm up when we're dropping, it's, you don't want to lift your knees up too high. It's just kind of, you're mowing the grass, so to speak. And um, the next one, we're just kind of flipping our hips. This is a good, a good drill. Um, honestly, to, to evaluate, evaluate how good guys hips are, you know, in terms of when you're looking at high school kids and recruiting, it's also a good drill just to, make sure our hips are loose and warm. You can kind of see as we go through here that, you know, some guys are a little bit tighter, a little bit, um, a little tighter in the hips. Other guys are a little more fluid and, and, and can kind of do it a little bit easier. This big kid right here is from um, Hamilton. He's a freshman. He's a big boy that can really move and throw the ball. He's going to be a good player for us. So it's always, it's always nice to go above the border and, and, and grab some of those really good players up there. Um, same thing here. We're just dropping on a line, flipping the hips. You know, you, the big thing here is just like every drill that we work, I think ball security is, is always going to be stressed because it's the number one stat between winning and losing a game. If you can, you're always talking about having two hands on the ball, um, making sure it's protected in, in everything we do. Um, this, this is a, a drill that I really like. Um, once again, we're just dropping on a line here, but and, and we're going to react to the coach's clap or the coach's, you know, cue for him to throw it. So on, on this one, it's really just a matter of, you know, how quickly can you get your back foot in the ground and make an accurate throw? I think really quarterback play, that's really what it comes down to. When you see somebody open, like how quickly and how accurately can you get in the ball? Um, and, and I think that's something that you got to try to train. Um, but really it's, it's, pretty much that simple. So I think this is a drill that we're just going to get them going and, and you can, you can have them go as many steps as you want or as, as little as steps as you want. But when they, when, when they get that cue, that clap or that ball, um, we want them to, to get that thing out and quick and make an accurate throw. So it's, you could probably, you know, would like more urgency on these guys drops, get them going a little faster and then really, really stress it, you know, like make it game like, um, but you can see Quincy here, our, our, when, he, when he sticks that foot, he kind of pops up, right, and doesn't drive through the throw and kind of gets that front knee locked out. We, we prefer those shoulders to stay more level and rotate through that thing. Um, and that's something – I think something you always want to work on as a, as, a, as a quarterback or with the guys. And keeping it really simple, I think you have to play with good knee bend. I think you, you want to play with – some knee bend and not straight up and down um, and staying athletic and, and then just playing with a good base. I think that's really important, not getting your feet too close together. Um, and that's something we'll continue to go over here as we, as we work. 
Um, this is the same thing. Now we're just for a right-handed quarterback, just kind of crossing over. And really it's just a, a way to get loose and then a way, Hey, when, when that guy's open, you got to flip your hips, get back to a base and make a good throw. Um, I think that's, that's just football for you when you're not playing seven on seven and things aren't, aren't exactly clean. Like how quick can you do that? Um, here's a couple of game examples, I guess, of, of maybe that drill coming into a, a game situation. So the quarterback's going to kind of drop back, look to his left, you know, nothing's there. He comes back to the seam throw on the right. Like if, if the quarterback hitches up here again, that's going to be late, but the back, the back foot's in the ground, that thing's out and we're able to make a completion. Um, so just being able to, Hey, when, when that back foot is, you know, underneath your back shoulder and you can kind of, you're ready to throw at any time. I think that's something that's, that's valuable um, in terms of playing the position, not always having to hitch up, you know, being able to get that foot in the ground and drive a ball in there. Similar, similar situation here. Um, we kind of look left, nothing's there, you know, QB is kind of, he's taking a drop, looking left, gets, gets back, looks to his right. He sees a guy coming open, that back foot's in the ground. There's no hitch there. We're able to kind of get that foot in the ground and release it and get it out. Um, so, you know, not that there's going to be times when you're not going to be able to hitch up because that there will be times, but always being ready to throw. I think when, when somebody comes open, how fast and how accurate can you get in the ball? Uh, I think r really it's, it's, that's what quarterback, good quarterback play is. Um, si similar, just just a lot of footwork on these drills because I'm a. I, I think you really got to have fast feet to play the position. You don't have to run a fast forty or anything, um, but you got to be able to move in the pocket a little bit, create a little extra time, get your feet in position to throw. Um, so this this drill is just whether we're doing like line hops or like scissors kicks just something where our feet aren't in a, in a great throwing position and, and our eyes are always up down the field. And then boom, when, when the coach makes a command, how can we get back to that base, you know, and make an accurate throw. Um, so that's just kind of some stuff we're working here. The guys have fun with it. Um, speed ladders. I, I think, you know, they're good for just working your footwork and having rhythm as a quarterback, but also it's a, just something we do try to as a warm up before practice to to work our ball security. Two hands on the ball, um, going through the ladder, and then just kind of being creative at the end in terms of how we want to make a throw. Um, whether it's falling away, whether we're popping our feet to set, um, but just kind of just kind of having fun with it a little bit. Here's one more, but I think have, having a a quarterback that has quick feet, you know is is something we want to drill every single day and it's extremely important to play in the position i feel like whether you're a a blazing runner or not but being able to to buy yourself some extra time um I, i'm sure you've you've seen this one on on you know on twitter and, and in the nfl circles you know like this this is probably my favorite drill or one of my favorite drills for um for practice as an everyday drill, it's called the base base bag drill, where there's three three bags. Um, a, a lot of the Shanahan, like Kyle Shanahan guys, are do this drill, and you can see the, you know, you see them working on it. It makes it makes sense because I think, I think when you're in the pocket, I think playing playing quarterback with a really good base in terms of having your feet shoulder width or maybe a little wider, like that's really important. And, and then the other thing would be being able to make throws um, where you're not necessarily taking a long stride. I think really great quarterbacks, they don't really take long strides when they throw. It's a, it's more of a, a no step or a really short stride when they throw. Um, and that's two re a couple of reasons probably would be, you know, it, it's just less room for error. You're more balanced up that foots in the ground quicker. Um, and there's, you're not as long with it. Um, and another re reason would be there's a lot of time, as a quarterback, I don't think you're able to step into a throw. So if there's some trouble in the pocket or some, some chaos going around, like, can you keep your base and be able to rotate and make a throw? So this drill is just kind of working, you know, subtle pocket movements with your back foot, but it's also 
something where we just put a, a, a quarterback in the middle and, and we're keying that defender. If he goes one way, we throw opposite. And, and the, the, the coach is just going to kind of move that quarterback. And, and whether you throw left or throw right, it's the same principle. Like you might not be able to step into that thing, but you have your base and you're able to, to get that ball where it needs to be as soon as, as soon as that guy becomes open. We're in, not everything's perfect, but just trying to play with that. I think every position in football, like you're always in a better, better position when your ankles are apart. You don't want those ankles together because you don't have a lot of power um, from that position. This is a good example of a game rep um, where we kind of, we kind of miss on a protection there, but our, our guys able to slide a little bit and keep that base. You can see his feet are in a good throwing position, even though, there's a backer about to drill him um, and he's able to make a really, really accurate, impressive throw um, from that position where he can't step into it. He's, he's almost drifting away from it as he makes the throw, but that's, that's a good example of just saying like things aren't always going to be clean. Um, here's an example of where they are clean. Um, and we're still getting to that base position where there's really not a lot of step. Like that front foot is basically staying the right where it's at. And, and that front knee is there's some bend in that front knee and we rotate um, with the back hip, but a lot less room for air when you're not taking long strides as a quarterback. If you get a good, nice base, a good bend in your front knee, and then it's just a, just a short, short stride where you're picking it up and putting it back down. Kind of similar to what we've been talking about, just back foot in the ground, ball, guys open. How quickly can we get it to them? Just to just kind of reemphasize and hey, when when we're in the pocket, um, we want to play with 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 that base and, and be able to to make throws, you know, from that position. But if it's not not exactly clean, you still might be able to shuffle and kind of get it off. So. In, Probably a few too many clips here, but you can see we're a we're a big quick game and kind of play action team as far as what we do on offense. Um, similar situation here where we're going to kind of basically we're running a double move, um, kind of a, a, a pump and a screen and then throw them behind it, where we're going to pump that bubble. But same thing, like you'll see our quarterback, you know, he kind of gets right back to that good position. There's not a lot of ankle. The ankles aren't clicking together. And I think that's a big, it's a big coaching point for quarterbacks. I think if you can play from a position like that, the the accuracy from the, you know, from the throw will be more consistent. Similar, similar one right here, same type of play call. We're just gonna pump a bubble and then we're getting back to that nice position right there where it's where it's a our feet are not together oh, this is the last one here but that's that's something obviously we've, we talked about it a little bit here but that's that's a great drill I really like that one picked it up from you know Twitter and just something you, you see consistently, but just because there's so many tools out there to, um, to kind of have with the access to YouTube and, and everything online now. Um, I thought that was a really good drill here. Here's just something we just some agile and more agile bag drills that we try to work really mainly. It's a lot about ball security. Um, but also just when we're shuffling in the pocket, just kind of working on, not clicking our ankles together and more so, you know, pushing off the insides of our feet and keeping a base where we're driving this. He's probably a little more on his toes. You know, we want to be on the insides of our feet and kind of feel ourselves pushing into the ground a little bit. So we have that power. It's probably similar to like plain old line, like in other positions where it's like, Hey, you have the weight on your instep. So you, you know, you're balanced and you're, you have power, but so like, I like these drills just because you can really harp on the ball security, which, 
that's going to win or lose you a game. If you can take care of the ball, you're going to have a really good chance. Um, so just something we always talk about in our drills, having two hands on the ball. So here's an example where, you know, we take it, we're drop back pass, third and 10, high rush off the edge. We kind of step up, but the, the shuffle up here is not necessarily, we're not clicking our ankles together. It's more of a, you know, we're pushing, we're keeping that base as we move up and we're able to deliver it down the field. But that's kind of, you know, the, the, the ability to kind of just you – know, our, our guy's not a great runner, but he can he can buy time just with instincts and just feel in the pocket. And I think it's it's something you can drill, and I think that's important. It's also something that is a little bit natural, and you have to recruit it. So And, and some guys are a little bit better at it than others. Um, just another drill to, to work our hips and, and – just basically quarterback agility, you know, just something where we're, we want to work our feet and our hips a lot. Okay. This is an, another drill that I really like in terms of um, just throwing on the run. Cause I think regardless of the level, um, something that we probably don't practice enough as quarterbacks is, is throwing on the move. Um, Cause you, you, there's a lot, like a lot of routes on air. There's seven on seven that you go to a practice, you go to a team, like a lot of drop back, like, but in reality, like in games, one guy gets beat or, or there's, there's probably five, 10 situations a game. I don't know, like where the quarterback has to throw on the run and you got to be able to practice throwing on the run if you're going to do it. Um, so we are a, you know, we sprint out, we run nakeds and, and we, we move our quarterback, but this is just a drill where we're going we're to have an, and rushing the quarterback and if if the end goes you know this is one where the end's gonna high rush so he high rushes we step up two hands on the ball and then we're able to, to get outside and make a throw and you can put the receivers wherever outside inside on the hash um you can put two out there and have one of them flash his hands but just something where you're making your guy work to get outside the pocket and, and make a throw on the run. There's got to be good urgency with it. You know, I think he's got to get going a little bit there, but we're just trying to, to step up. Things aren't clean. We escape. We use our athleticism to make a throw on the run. So similar type deal here. We're in the pocket. Scramble drill, right? Scramble drill. So we're, we're able to step up. And I think on the scramble drill, I don't – I don't know what a lot of people teach, but I, I think when I've heard this before, like we're going to look outside first. Like if we can find somebody on the sideline when we scramble, that's ideal because now we're not throwing back over the middle across our body. Um, and, and usually those are safe, clean throws and you can see them. And, th and if we don't see anybody on the sideline, we're going to look back to the inside. Um, and then if we don't see anybody on the inside, we're running or throwing back to the outside because you can kind of move the defense with your eyes. Sometimes you look outside, you look back inside. You, you sometimes might be able to go back to the outside, but this is a really nice throw. He, he probably could have ran there too. Like I said, but I think it's something you just, you, you got to try try to find ways to drill um, throwing on the move because it, it will happen in games, whether you plan for it or not. Um, and we plan for it with, with some scheme plays where we're moving the pocket. And then there's other times where it's, it just kind of happens. But now there's this is one where the, there's a low rusher. We escape over the top, two hands on the ball. We're just we're finding a receiver. So it's nothing nothing revolutionary. But I think the the more you drill it, and the more you, the guys can get comfortable throwing on the move from different positions, um, the more successful you're going to be in terms of more tools you're going to have as a QB. And just with the with the like I said earlier, with the the best teams we played this year had had really really good D lines. I feel like at the high high, high levels, I think when you want to get to where you want to get to, that those D linemen are really dang good. So just being able to have some tools to get away from guys and and make throws and, and move the pocket to create some issues for those guys, I think is is important. But that's an example. Hey. He's able to escape high over the top because they lose contain. We're able to get outside the pocket. Hey, where's our eyes going right now? They're going right to the outside. Is somebody outside? Great. Get it to them.
another good job here. Like we're throwing a double move to the field on first and 10. And, and this is good. This is just a good job by the like, quarterback. Just understanding, Hey, it's first and 10. We don't have to throw the double move if we don't love it. You know, back in the day with coach Sharp, man, I, if we ever called the double move, I was throwing it. Like it didn't matter. <laughs> like you, as a quarterback, you, you get that, you get that call, but just having a smart guy in there, you're, if, if you can understand as a play call, hey, Mike, and teach your guy, like, all right, like, if it's not there, let's not force it on first and 10. Um, you're able to call some more of that stuff because you trust that your guy's going to make the right decision. So just another example of, hey, I escaped the pocket. Where do my eyes go? My eyes go right to the sideline. And can I – now we have six yards on first and 10. It's a good, good efficient play. Um, so I think – Something when your when your quarterback gets outside the pocket, I think the easiest thing for them to do is look outside first. And do I have an outlet to get rid of the ball to gain yards? And if you do, you can get rid of it. If not, look back to the inside if you have time. Um, just an example of a naked play where we're we're working the pocket, but I think I think drilling it gives the guys confidence to go do it because there are situations that will come up where you're going to have to make plays on the move. And I don't, I don't think a lot of guys practice that growing up. It's a lot of just kind of, we're just going to train. We're going to go to seven on seven or we're just going to throw. And that's okay too. But I think it's, it's key that you're able to create those situations for your players and, and put them in position to, to have success. We, like I we said, we do a lot of sprint out. So one key fundamental, I think throwing on the run, like, that I, maybe that I I kind of think works. Um, by no means am I an expert on anything, but I think when you're throwing on the run, like I was always kind of taught, hey, follow your throw and, and run downhill where you throw it to, to kind of follow it. Um, and that's really good. I think there's other situations where you're going to have somebody right in your face and if you run into it, it's going to hurt really bad. So I think another coaching point would be on the run, getting that back hip through. See that his back right hip, his throwing hip, getting that thing through towards the throw um, with some violent or with some, you know, some some rotation. I think that's key. Whether you're throwing left or right, that that throwing hip um, as you come through on it is is something that we could coach up. Um, see if I froze here. What are we on? 52. All right. I think we're good. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. Hey, I got some questions in the chat. I might, uh, Oh, you got the Twitter hands there. There we go. All right. So this one, um, and yes, all of this stuff on this video or any PowerPoint, just email me or Twitter. Like I can get you all this stuff, but this is just another example of a sprint out where we're, we're working that throwing on the run. I think in a lot of our sprint out concepts, you're basically cutting the field in half, right? Like we like to sprint out and throw back and those are specialty plays. But um, a lot of times when you sprint out, it's, it's, Hey, is there somebody open in the flat? Okay. I'm going to throw it to him right now. I'm going to throw a hitch, a speed out. Um, and then, Hey, if that guy's not open, now we have to adjust and, and go to number two in the progression. Right. So like, here, like we're running a smash concept, and they cover it pretty well. They're covered too, too, like, and our guy just kind of makes a really good, really good throw to a spot where only his guy can get it. But similar stuff where it's like, hey, we got to train, we got to train her and give our guys the opportunity where, you know, they can have success. And we wouldn't, the other thing is like, find out what your quarterbacks are good at. I think that's something that was echoed two weeks ago in this thing was like, that's the, probably the most important thing is find out what they're good at, ask them what they like, try to do that stuff over and over by doing it a bunch of different ways and not making it, it too complicated. Um, here's another, this is a, a good example of just, uh, you know, more pocket movement stuff where we're just kind of shuffling and checking it down. Um, you know, I think I had a drill for that. That was kind of showed this stuff, but, just finding creative ways to, to, to make the quarterback move subtly, um, throw off balance um, is 
like I said, is 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 important. I'm gonna see if I can. I might have to exit out of this here. I'm gonna just to get it going again. Yeah, I'm gonna just. I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna I'm gonna exit out of this DV Sport. Try to sign back in. Sounds good. Okay, just a few more here. Charles, what did you use back in the day? LRS? That? We had LRS when I was there with you guys. LRS. When I started GN, that was LRS. I don't even know if that's alive anymore, is it? Like, um, LRS Sports? I think they might still be down at the computer. I think. But I don't know. Yeah. Okay. We also had VHS tapes. I had uh, the stack of, of uh, VCRs that I had to dub out to. So that was fun. I might have been one of the last. Um, like high school, like VHS. Yeah, when we sent them all out to you guys. Yeah, the Wisconsin boys. I I hear you. Okay, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share this thing again here. Zoom. Um, how do I? How do I share this thing? I go back to the menu showing up at the top. Yeah, the there screen. we go. I had to I had to maximize it or whatever. Okay. Let me know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, you're good. Sorry about that. All right, so this, this is just another one where there's interior pressure and somebody gets beat inside right away, center guard, whatever, like just having a reaction where we can, we can move a little bit and make an off balance throw, um, you know, from a, from a platform that's not necessarily normal um, or something we don't practice a lot. So I'm just a big believer in that sort of stuff. Um, we kind of already watched that one. Um, now, now we're going to go ahead and move to our right and, and throw on the run or set up. Sometimes you might have to, you get out, you got some room. Now you want to set up and throw, but just working stuff where, Hey, the picture changes. Like it's not how we drew it up or, Hey, we have to react now and go make a play. Just trying to give them those tools. Um, actually, I think this is a, uh, just a sprint out throwback type play. Like we talked about, we like to move the pocket. Now we're going to sprint out you know, try to throw back to the, the X receiver on the backside, the single receiver. But same same type of stuff where, like, the quarterback's moving, but when he gets set up, he gets back to that nice throwing position and that good base, right, like where his ankles are apart and that that stride length when he – with his front foot is not, like it, – it's, it's super short. Um, similar drill here, but now it's just, as opposed to we're going to escape outside. Now we want to climb the pocket. And, and I think as a quarterback, anytime you're behind the line of scrimmage, like you have to be a threat to throw, um, because it puts a lot of conflict for a defender when you, when you're attacking the line of scrimmage, like, Hey, is he going to run? Is he going to throw? If you're behind the line of scrimmage, just having that threat, um, to use your arm. Um, and there's different guys like, our quarterback this year, that number two, he's gonna he's more likely to step up and throw. Um, this bigger kid from from Canada, who's a really really good athletic runner and also a good thrower, but he's probably more likely to just go, hey, I'm gonna use my feet and make him tackle me and get downhill. So I think that's here's another just movement drill, climbing up in the pocket, two like two hands on the ball, keep your eyes up downfield. Hey, can you go make a throw? Can you find somebody open? Great. If not. We're going forward for a couple yards. I think Quincy, like, he no look past there. He got – probably got bored when I was filming drills with him. Um, but there's there's a lot you can do that way. And I think you got to keep it fun, too. Like, that's one thing. Coach Sharves has been around me, like, probably get bored pretty easily, you know, and you got to work every day drill. But just finding a way to keep, keep the game fun because it's a lot of work. And, like, here's an example of – I don't even know if this is, like, you can coach this. It's just a kid making a play, but just the example of a, Hey, a guy keeping his eyes up as he's scrambling, eyes are up, eyes are up. And he's able to find somebody down the field. And 
like we talked about earlier, his eyes are up, but also when he, when he gets to a point where he can't move anymore, he gets back to a decent base and makes a throw. Um, a couple reps here where, where we're just there. It's, it's not a clean picture right here, but as, as you step up in the pocket, just being able to keep your eyes up when there's a little bit of, a little bit of, stuff going on in front of you that, that doesn't look pretty. Um, and like I said, some guys are more able to, to have that poise when things are like that as others. But I think if you drill it, maybe, maybe you can improve it, you know, but th that's stuff that does come up just because you'd like to think it's always going to be clean. Um, but finding ways to rep situations where a hey, quarterback's going back to throw the ball. It's not, it's not completely clean or he's got to wait a little bit for somebody to come open, like just a mesh play here where he's got to step up a little bit and just kind of find a way to get it to him. Doesn't look pretty, but I think it's keeping our eyes up down the field as, as we move um, is, is critical to kind of play in the position. I think um, this is something that, we're a big, like, we're not big. We, we, we run a lot of like screens, uh, whether they're called screens or screens in the run game where we're attaching stuff and just kind of looking at leverage or counting numbers. Um, but I think training your quarterbacks to have fast, fast feet, fast arms in the quick game stuff where you're throwing that is important. So right here, we just call it a quick release drill. Where we're, we're trying to throw three balls as fast as we can. Like, and we like those snaps rapid fire. Um, and we're just trying to get it out and be accurate. But I think it's, it's more, this is more about just training your arms and your feet to be really fast. Like you might, you're going to become accurate with it, but you want to get that feeling where it's like, you're pushing yourself to throw it as fast as you can get those laces and get it out. Um, you might not even get the laces, but just getting, it's more of a feel thing where you just get comfortable doing it. Uh, so then in a game where it's like, you might slow it down a little bit, but it's also, it's still fast, you know? So just at, at first with this drill, it's kind of less about accuracy and more about just, Hey, get it out, you know, be really fast, get, get your back foot in the ground, flip your hips and let it rip. Um, and you can see, see like the big 14, like we want to try to get him playing with more knee bend and, and playing He's six, five, probably playing about six, three, you know, just with his, with his knee bend and um, being able to rotate a little bit more, but just a couple examples of, you know, the RPO stuff and the having, having the ability to get the ball out quickly. Um, but more importantly, like I said earlier, accurately as well. Like if it's quick and it's in the dirt or it's not accurate, that doesn't really help you that much. So I, I think like it, Three things I think are are critical to, to drilling probably like every day would be, you know, some sort of quick release drill where you're get, catching and getting the ball out um, as fast as you can just to train that. Um, throwing on the run, like I said, and that that drill where it's you're just keeping that base and working that working on rotation. But here, this is basically the drill. It's just catch and throw. But really, on those on these. Shorter throws, it's a lot of it's about ball placement, you know, in terms of where you're putting it on the receiver. Are you going to allow that guy to have generate some yards after catch with the where you put the ball, or is it going to be, you know, somewhere that doesn't give him momentum to go do that? So I think the the accuracy will come with that as you drill it, but I think our guys he does a nice job with that putting in, in the right spots, you know, and, and this is another one where you'll just kind of, it's third and two, but, and you attach, attach a screen to it and you'll kind of live with it. But, you know, from the box, it's, you know, you guys coaching old line, right? Like you just hand it off. <laughs> that one looks good. So, um, but I think that's kind of what we like to do with our, like, see the, this is another one where it's, I think it's really important when you're, like not clicking his ankles together. You see how he keeps his ankles apart, whether that's quick game, whether that's throwing down the field, like that short jab right there with that front foot is going to help, help accuracy. 
and it's like my golf swing, right? The longer I get, the less, the less accurate. It's kind of like a, it's a rotational deal, just like a football thrower. Like it, the more compact, the more tight you are, like you're probably going to hit it straighter, which is why I'm not good at golf. Um, but same thing here. We're just kind of getting our feet to a quick popping our feet to a base, getting it out there. Um, and same thing, really. Like this is the other thing, like with your drills, I think is like, what do you do on offense? Like how, are, how do those drills marry up to the plays that you're running? So you can give your guys a chance to, to be the best they can be. So I think that's a whole other, you know, thing with just making sure that there's a, a rhyme or reason to everything that you do in terms of kind of how your plan goes together. But there's some, some different things that just ball handling and, and play action fakes and just little things at the position where you wouldn't think they make a big difference, but I think um, the really, really great quarterbacks, they really a lot of attention to detail and then just, they kind of push the envelope too with just kind of which, how they make throws, you know, how they do certain stuff. I think that's, and it makes it fun too. That makes playing the position a little, as you challenge yourself. Here's just some, some stuff that we like to do on offense in terms of run pass options. And like, this is a concept where he really can't step into it. We're teaching him more to, we want you to kind of throw this with a little bit of a fade. So we, we take away that angle from the D end, you know, to be able to tip that ball or something. I think that's it for the for the video i'm going to stop the share um were you able to see the video clear coach yeah, yeah. It was good. okay cool does any anybody have any questions i if you have a question guys just go ahead and unmute and you can ask it uh yeah. if you're on youtube live just uh type it in the chat and i'll ask it for you so uh lots of great things on there danny i like that uh the little flood concept uh Versus Western Illinois and uh, was it James Madison? You hit them on it too. That was nice. Yeah, it's, like sprinting out. Yeah, it's a. I don't know our our. You know, I think like, like I mentioned earlier, like we tried to help the old line a little bit. You know, with just throwing quick, and then when we when we did throw it down the field, try to keep an extra guy or two in, and that's just kind of. I think one of the things we did a good job of this year was just kind of having a better plan of like who we are you know like the first year we were calling plays it was just kind of like let's run this let's run that and like uh, it's probably more important that the players know who you are you know like we kind of just said we kind of put it on paper like hey this is what we do and I think that really helped us and because we've been doing it for two years uh, with the same offensive staff and we took a jump this year and we have really good players but I thought I thought that helped just simplifying like having a vision and having a hey this is kind of what we are on offense I I thought that really helped us Nice. Is there something that you're doing now as a OC quarterbacks coach that you wish you would have known as a player that you think would have helped you big time then? You know, what's funny. Like I probably know, I probably, you know, I probably know too much now where it's like, I would think too much. Like, I think the game is actually like, it's kind of a simple game and I think you can overcomplicate it. Um, probably just like coverages, like, and they weren't as complicated back then. Like, I would just kind of get up there and see one high, two high, or see man or zone and just kind of, and that's kind of just what you lived with. Um, maybe, you, maybe you some high 60% uh, completion guys. So yeah, I would just throw screens all day, you know, um, <laughs> just, especially when it wasn't going well, you just throw a screen out to a really good player, but yeah. I, that's a good question. I don't, I, sometimes I think about that. Like I just, and it's actually probably a good coaching point for the quarterbacks. Like the guys were talking a couple of weeks ago, like I think it was um, Dickinson, maybe coach. You see the one out in. Um, yeah. He just like, don't, don't give them too much information. Only give them the information that they, they can use. Um, I think you can really paralyze guys sometimes when you just give them too much. I think like those guys made such good points. I was really kind of on board with what they were saying. And I thought that made a lot of sense to me. So I, I would agree. Like, don't overcomplicate it, but you also have to 
they have to know enough where they can be be yeah. a guy in the field that can operate. I don't see anything on the uh, on YouTube live popping up. Any of the guys in the room, you guys can go ahead and, and unmute and ask your questions. Otherwise, we'll let Danny get home. He's been doing recruiting all day, and uh, he's got uh, a few little ones at home he needs to get home to. So, yeah, I'm gonna, we got one day camp tomorrow, so that'll be fun. <laughs> hey, hopefully the borders are back open. We can get some some Winnipeggers down here. You know, we usually yeah, get a you miss out on having all your Canadians down. That'll be that. Maybe, maybe the July camp. Yeah. Well, hey, I'll do a shameless plug. UND has always recruited Canadians. So um, if you guys, uh, the high school guys, if you have um, players you think are, are Division One type guys, Division One FCS type guys, uh, hit up Danny on, on Twitter um, and he'll get you in touch with whoever recruits Canada. They, they split it up a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, UND's always had Canadian guys in their roster. Uh, they've had a bunch of guys go to the CFL, um, an American guy that was from there, the Weston Dressler, everyone knows him, uh, played with Danny at the same time there. Um, but, yeah, so if you got any guys, just reach out to them because they, they do truly recruit Canadian players. Um, there's always a few guys usually on the roster. So, But if uh, nobody's got any questions, uh, we'll let you go, Danny. Appreciate you yeah. jumping on with us and uh, doing the presentation. Yeah, if there's another couple of these and you want to get another position from our staff, I'm sure if there's any requests, like I can let them know. So if you're awesome. looking we'll for a speaker, then. getting going again in Dece in uh, in January, so we'll be hitting you guys up. Okay, sounds good. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. Yep. See ya. Thanks, Coach. All right, Rick, you there? I'm here. Great job, Danny. Thanks. We'll always take defensive guys. We got lots of offensive guys that'll share stuff, but the defensive guys seem a little more shy for some reason. I don't know. They uh, they don't want to give away all their trade secrets on how to stop your quarterback from getting out of that pocket. I guess so. Well, their DC their DC played uh, at the same time I was there too. So Brett Holinka. So we'll get him on uh, next January to do a presentation. He's uh, played outside linebacker, um, but I'm sure he's got some some linebacker stuff that he could help us out with. Sounds good. So, yeah, as we uh, continue on with the uh, presentation, so uh, J.P. Aslan, he, uh, he's been one of our first guys to do some stuff, and uh, he, uh, he worked last week here in, in recruiting uh, Jamie Brise to, to do some stuff. Uh, Jamie's coached at sort of every level and uh, pro and, and uh, amateur and everything else. So he's uh, been with Team Canada and in the CFL and worked at the U level, and probably uh, I know he talked last week about working with some young kids right now. So... Without uh, without too much more introduction, we'll turn it over to Jamie to uh, to talk a little bit more about quarterback play. I think he's also our first doctor to present too. So it's doctor. Nice. You're muted, Jamie. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Uh, thanks for having me, and this has been great, this whole thing every Wednesday night. I really appreciated it and appreciate uh, being invited. I wasn't quite certain what uh, direction you wanted me to take here, Paul, and um, I have a lot of uh, things that I can show, and um, some of it overlaps what Danny just talked about, and I'll try to dodge around that. Um, you know, as I was being invited, I heard different guys ask for different things, and not necessarily in terms of daily drills, although I, I will talk about that. But I also have some concepts. And I also have um, uh, some things, some perspectives about the position that I feel is really important. And, you know, those guys, when they came on, uh, I'm talking about Dave and um, uh, Anthony and um, Kahari um, uh, and Danny, um, you know, they were great. And the one thing I wanted to do is try to talk about this in terms of um, how to reach kids with this and just how important this position is. Um, this is something that I've been very passionate about. It's uh, since I started my time playing the, you know, the, the sport, this is what I've played, um, mostly what I've coached. And I've kind of tracked uh, as many people that I felt were experts at this position and uh, just try to pick up as much as I could. 
So the one thing that's really come clear to me is the fact that this is um, probably the most exciting position to play. Um, it's also the most difficult position to play in sports. I really was, uh, you know, I was fortunate to be in the room. Uh, you know, uh, I had, I coached Danny McManus. I coached Kahari for a couple months. I can't say I, I claim anything that they did. I was in the room with um, Dave Dickinson. I saw what he was um, capable of. Um, They're all great leaders. I coached against Kelvio and saw what he was able to do. And the one thing that really comes clear for me and uh, was this is really a leadership position more than anything. And um, I'm going to talk about that at first, and then I'll get into some other things. And um, I, I've got enough. My uh, DV sport thing blew up on me yesterday, and I was frantic um, trying to get it back in order for tonight. And um, I, my backup plan was to go without DV sport, but we got it worked out. But anyway... I've got enough here to keep you till, you know, you have to tell me when to stop. Okay. So um, let me put it that way. I'll just start here and let me find my. um, Those uh, guys might log off when they're ready to go. You can just keep rolling. Yeah. I'll I'll watch the numbers. They'll probably dwindle quickly, but um, so my share button, let me just do this. Nope. Of course, I lost my share button. Is it full screen right now? No, it's not. Yeah, so hit it to full screen. I think it hides your toolbar. Yeah. Can you see that? Yep, we got it. Okay. Anyway, um, I mean, these are all things I could talk about right now. And I thought the most important thing was to just talk about this from a leadership perspective. Um, The one thing about it is, you know, you're going to deal with a kid who's going to be representative of your team and your program and yourself. And um, I was brought up with this idea that the wrong play called by the right quarterback has a better chance of success than the right play called by the wrong guy. And um, I mean, I'm sure we've all been in the situation where we've been on a team and, you know, we've talked as coaches and said, you know, this kid may not be the best guy athletically or numbers wise, but he has something that the other guys don't have. And so this has been something that's been etched in my mind for a number of years. Um, You may not know who this is, but, I feel it's really important that you share different stories about things outside of football. This is Sergeant York. Okay. And for me as a coach, these kids at this position have to know who Sergeant York is. And it's a true story. Um, This is a world war one veteran. Um, He got the medal of honor. He captured 132 Germans by himself. Okay. It's a true story. And, you know, I tell the story in the quarterback room and I use it to explain, you know, this was a guy and I use this comment often about don't complain, don't explain. You know, your job is to be Sergeant York. You have to climb the hill. You have to be able to overcome tremendous circumstances. And if your players see you as someone who's disingenuous, they will see right through you. And um, you will lose all of your ability to be a leader. Again, it doesn't matter, you know, how good you are, but your players have to buy into who you are. And so this is a real critical thing. So I kind of uh, uh, present this um, half jokingly, but at the same time, you know, it comes up all the time. Are you Sergeant York? Are you going to take us down the field at the end of the game? And are you going to be able to, um, throw hot off the nose man like they showed in that video there. Danny had a great picture there where the guy had us put his foot in the ground and throw hot and um, things are not going to work out perfectly. You have to be the guy that makes things happen. So anyway, I take time explaining this. Um, this was a kid in my background. Um, uh, we had at Penn State 
And um, this kid um, went to Moeller High School and never lost a game in high school. Um, you'll never hear of him. Uh, played for us and started in um, 24 games. He only lost one game. And you would have thought that this would be a pro player. But, I mean, pro scouts would come in and watch him throw, and they couldn't believe that he was our starter. But he was. And he was a tremendous leader, and he got things done. It helped that we had a, a very intelligent staff that knew how to put, put things around him and put him in place. But he knew how to make decisions and he knew how to lead. And he was the guy that we had at the front of the bus. And that was a really important um, concept at that time. We would travel on buses to, to go to the stadium for our home games. And he was the first guy um, at the front of the bus and sat right beside the head coach. He was the first guy off. And he was basically Sergeant York. And so his name was John Schaefer, if you ever want to look him up. But um didn't do many, many things mechanically, but very well, but he was a great leader. Um, this is a, uh, a thing that I often talk about is a person's um, tremendous abilities, okay? And you have reactions that are instant. They are as quick as anyone's. You can train somebody to be a quarterback very easily because of their innate abilities, okay? You have two eyes, retina, optic nerve, everything. And they will register broad and complete pictures in a hundredth of a second, okay? Um, your mind will show, um, store a picture of every important thing that happens on every football play. And once your body gets a feel for the movement, you'll have that in your memory for as long as you live. Um, once your mind apprehends a concept, you will have it for as long as you live. I tell, I used to tell our players that, um, you know, I expect you to come back to the team reunion when you're 65 years old in a drunken stupor and be able to execute this play. Um, I mean, you do it over and over, and you should be able to have an ability to remember how that play works. <clears throat> um, you must be able to react to the sight of danger. This is the whole thing about being a quarterback. Um, Danny said it in a very different way. Okay, he said you have to make reactions. I, my thing is that you have to be able to react to the sight of danger and be able to stay away from danger. And you have to be able to, as a coach, you have to be able to put them in positions where they have to react. And, you know, you watch the combine and you watch them in underwear and things like that. And that isn't even close to what these guys have to do under pressure. So you have to be able to um, put yourself in dangerous situations, whether it's a pass rusher whether it's a, um, a defensive coverage player and be able to react accordingly. Okay. Um, let me move on. Okay. Um, this is really an important thing. You know, you brought up the thing about the, the doctor thing and I was very lucky when I was um, and I don't want to bore anybody with this stuff, but I was in cognitive psychology, how people learn skills. And how much can you see is the big question that always came up. As a quarterback, this is a really important aspect of play, okay? So you, your eyes have the ability to jump from place to place, okay? And they fix. They don't scan. Um, how much can your body and your mind learn? There is no known limit. As a coach, as a coach, I pushed the kids that I had. I had a kid that was... Um, he wanted to be a pro player. And um, I knew I had him the moment he said that. And I said, well, listen, okay, you're a Canadian and this is what you have to do because you have to overcome a lot here. And this because of the red flag that's on your back, which is really unfortunate. And, you know, the thing that he needed to do was just to be able to absorb and learn as many concepts and get as many reps as he could. And I tried to expose him to as many things as possible. We basically, um, three times a week during the summer, we would review every CFL game that was on. I always had access to the CFL games. I had them downloaded to DV Sport, and he was in my office, and we knew everything that every team was running, just about. And I was able to communicate with him at a certain level. And so he had to eat football, which is, if that's what he wanted to do, be a pro player, that's what he needed to do. 
Okay, how, how do you, this, I don't know if you can see this, but this says, how do you thaw out frozen eyes? How do you, how do you make your eyes see everything? And um, the first few times, you, you, and as a coach, you have to realize this, that the quarterback is not going to see everything, okay? The first few times a quarterback executes a play, he won't see much of what is in front of him. And his mind and his eyes are frozen. And again, I'm going to go back to a lot of the research that I did. One of the terms that came up in my studies and Malcolm Gladwell, I can, you know, I, I love his work, but he wasn't the first to come up with this stuff. But, you know, hysterical blindness, World War I, how many soldiers died, died without pulling the trigger? Okay. Hysterical blindness, your, your, your visual field gets very constrained because you're just so, you're at a point where you are oversensitized. And so what you need to be able to do, and this is a, uh, uh, a big argument for getting as many reps as you can as a quarterback. There is a reason why um, certain quarterbacks in the NFL will not let the backup take reps, okay? Tom Brady will not let the backup take reps. Um, I coached at Central Florida, and uh, our head coach was a guy by the name of Mike Kruzik. And I don't know if any of you guys know who Mike Kruzik was, but he was the backup for Terry Bradshaw for five years. And he said during his time with the Steelers, he never got a rep, never got a rep. And he carried that philosophy with him as the head coach the Central at University of Central Florida. I was the quarterback coach. And I had four kids sitting there, and our starter was the only guy who got reps. We had four scholarship kids sitting there, and all they were able to do was basically warm up and watch. And that was it. And that we were fortunate we got through. I mean, the kid never got hurt. He ended up getting suspended. When he got suspended, our program went downhill very quickly. But um, I don't think I would operate that way, but this is – an argument for getting as many reps as you can. And basically it says here, um, gradually you will get to see more. It is as if your mind and your eyes thaw out. Okay. Um, seeing more has nothing to do with any special ability or intelligence. Not at all. I mean, Drew Brees is really from that perspective, from that perspective of being able to see things, he's no different than anybody here on this call. Okay. I mean, obviously he has other skills. Um, but anyway, that's a really important aspect. So this will never stop. This thawing process never stops. And a quarterback will see more and more as they operate in the position. And so this, you know, uh, there's a reason why, and Bob Wiley brought it up a couple of weeks ago, um, some old players are really, really more efficient at this stage in their career than they ever were before. <clears throat> before. And a lot of it has to do with, the fact that they've got more reps, they've seen it over and over. And um, I, I know myself with my experience, um, again, I didn't coach Dave Dickinson directly. That was Jacques' job, Jacques Chapdelaine. But I was there. I was able to see what an old pro would be like. And I remember him distinctly saying, you know, at Pass Skeleton, he said, Dave would say something to the effect, I only need two or three reps here. I did, There's a new play. I need to do this one play just so I can see it. I remember him telling Jacques that distinctly um, he'd see because he had seen things over and over again. And so um, this is something that I feel really important and something that you have to understand as a coach when you're training a young guy. OK, um, they have to get reps. I will get into other stuff here later. But with that in mind, I will tell you that, you know, we ran a, uh, a coded offense when I was at Ottawa. And the reason we did it was we used one word commands and we never huddled and we would have a 20 minute pass skeleton period. And we went fast. And the reason we went fast is why I wanted that kid, that quarterback, everything was geared around getting that kid ready. And so um, uh, I needed him to get as many reps as he could. I didn't want to have to take time to huddle, um, and get into a fuss with all the players about break the huddle properly. I needed them to run back, get lined up, and let's go and um, and get reps. And then from there, we would teach it from video. Um, okay. 
this is something I feel is really important as a coach. These are some of the responsibilities I feel coaches have to coach the position. Okay. Um, you got to make him do um, things he would not do on his own. I mean, you've just got to tell, tell him, look at, you've got to think of all the individual things that you need to do and do them on your own. I, I am going to sit here and coach you today, but if I have to retell it and if it's groundhog day, three days later, we're not making progress. Okay. We need to make progress. You need to take notes and you need to do, you know, I'm going to give you homework basically. Um, as a coach, you have to develop a language. Okay. And this is going to hold his mind on football. I will say this. I was very proud of the fact I was very lucky that I had six or seven kids that were really intelligent when I was at, when I started at the university of Ottawa, and I'm talking about receivers and quarterbacks and I could, I could talk to them and we developed the language where it was very easy to make adjustments. And I was not afraid. I was not afraid to make up plays on the sideline or listen to their suggestions on the sideline. I would not be opposed to having a discussion with these kids on Friday night at dinner and listening to a suggestion, putting it on the napkin and telling them, okay, we're going to run this in the warm up tomorrow. OK, because I, I just believe that we had developed such a, a line of communication. OK, we had did it all through the summer months. We were fortunate at the University of Ottawa. We had a bubble and we made sure we made sure that we had 20 practices done and we watched all the video, et cetera. It was very important. So this is the, the end result was that I was able to communicate with these guys at a certain level which I feel is a little bit different than maybe most than some situations. Okay. Um, he's got to be able to communicate with receivers. Okay. And they've got to be able to arrive at certain correction things, correction factors on their own. I'm working with a kid right now. I just happened to be walking through a school in Hamilton in November and a teacher grabbed me and said, look at, I'm I, we have this kid who is really uh, raw and we'd like you to work with them. And so I've been doing it. There's been a drastic improvement. I mean, the kid is very dedicated, but he's been able to bring out receivers and work with those guys. And they're talking about different things that have to happen uh, and making their own corrections, which is really what you need to have happen. Um, you know, I was fortunate, obviously, to work with a lot of great coaches um, and had great players. And, you know, the, the thing that uh, has been brought up to me was, the best quarterback receiver relationship it usually happens with best friends. Okay. They're people, the quarterback, the receiver, they're two people that really, they have a, a certain um, commonality between them. They, um, they are anxious to work together. They're anxious to communicate. And this is where, you know, you, you just throw them on the field, you give them the parameters and you let them work at it. And I really believe in that. And then they keep talking and talking and talking. Um, you have to always have a picture of what is really good for that quarterback to see. And I really believe this. I put up the picture there of uh, Sergeant York, but I'm very kind of disturbed by the fact that I'll bring up a name from the past, like maybe a guy like Sid Luckman or Johnny Unitas and these guys have no idea who you're talking about, none whatsoever. And it's disappointing to me. And so um, I was fortunate. Um, I went to a Super Bowl and I arrived at, uh, at the game. It was when the Saints played the Colts. And I arrived at the game at about three o'clock. The game was at 630. And I'm the only person sitting in the stands. And at about 330, Drew Brees came out with all of his receivers. And they started to uh, basically a warm up line. They started on the goal line and they threw every route in their tree. And the ball never hit the ground once. It was just unbelievable. And how accurate he was and how, you know, their rhythm was, they were all in sync. And so, you know, I'm going to show you a, uh, an illustration in a few minutes about how good he was in that game. But I feel it's really important that you keep putting. Uh, an example in front of your kid to show them what is really good. What is good footwork? What is good ball handling? What is a good delivery? And he's got to match that, that standard all the time. And this is historically, 
Um, there's so many people that he could look to and watch, and even in today's game. But I think he needs to have a historical perspective. <clears throat> as a coach, you have to make him as fast a player as possible, and you have to trust him and let him play. So, I mean, we've heard this many times. Dave said it. Um, Coach Friend said it. You know, maybe you need to limit what you do with him. Um, this will be, you know, make sure that he understands what you're doing and that'll allow him to be a fast player. Um, you have to make sure that he has only one voice that speaks to him consistently. Um, I I've had to, um, intervene several times. Uh, I know when I was, uh, at BC, um, you know, I sat and watched basically I was coaching a different position and I was, there was no way I was going to interfere with the line of communication that was between the quarterback coach and a guy like Dave Dickinson or Buck Pierce, et cetera. Okay. I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, they had their line of communication. They knew exactly what they were saying. And this is really important. Okay. The kid who plays the fastest obviously wins. Okay. Quarterback must play fast. He can't have doubt. And obviously if you play in the, in, if you want to play in the pros, you got to play fast. Um, Quarterback, obviously, he's got to know exactly what you're doing. Less is better. I mentioned that already. And you have to feel comfortable with him making throwaways, okay? And he has to understand that, okay? Throwaways, throwing the ball away, not taking a sack, um, going on to the next down. These are all okay things to do, okay? It's provided you have some intelligence and know what you're doing, Okay. The quarterback's responsibility, on the other hand, and this is where you have to nurture your kid. I feel this is really important, and I don't know if people really understand this, but he's got a responsibility if he's going to play this position, okay? So he's got to be able to come to you and, and say such things as, you know, I need more looks at this route. I need you to rep or script this more often. He's got to have that courage to come to you and almost be like a silent partner in this whole thing. He's the guy that's doing, he's the guy that's executing everything. He needs to be able to explain to you what he feels good about, what he needs more of. And you've got to nurture that, okay? Um, I don't know if anybody's going to feel comfortable about this, but sometimes I know a play is not going to work. I need to be able to change it. I mean, this is obviously you're giving him the keys to the car, and he's got to earn it, okay? He's got to earn it through his diligence and his work in the offseason, okay, and show that he can make these types of decisions. You've got to earn that trust, okay? Um, he's got to be able to come to you and without um, throwing somebody under the bus, you know, give you an indication as to what receiver he may like or what that receiver, what a certain receiver does that he likes, and make that receiver, put that receiver in a position where he is doing it more often, okay? Um, critical thing. Uh, you've got to allow, and your quarterback has got to have the ability to get up in front of the group and explain things, okay? This is only going to help him. It's going to make him learn the fastest, and you have to put pressure on him. It's got to be in his heart. OK, you can't put him up there unless he's prepared. And like I said, it's got to be in his heart and he's got to know it. If you're going to give him a concept to explain to the rest of the group, there cannot be any ums, haws or buts about it. He's got to know and it's got to come off his lips as if he was living it all his life. And when he gets up on the board, that's the other thing. I mean, obviously, um, I I was very strict with our kids. You had to have a notebook. Um, some of the kids that graduated when I was there, you know, they came back to me one day with like eight or nine notebooks that they had in the course of their time there, but they can't sit in the room and not take notes. Okay. They've got to be organized. Okay. And they, when I watch a kid get up on the board and, and scribble or not scribble, but draw a play, I know his level of experience right away. And so for me, it is really important that I see a kid who's got a firm hand when he's drawing a play. So I'm going to ask him to draw this concept, explain to me what you're doing and explain it to the rest of the group. I need to see, you know, circles that are consistent. 
I, I need to see his train of thought that is well organized and I need to see him be neat. And then I know he's got, you know, he knows what a right formation is, for instance, and he may, he doesn't hesitate when he draws it. <clears throat> Um, this is really important. The next one, the offensive leader, okay, the quarterback, he's got to be able to under, intercede for a misunderstood player. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, sometimes a receiver, you know, he may make a mistake, but – and then the next thing you know is that coach is all over that receiver. This is when the, court, the quarterback needs to jump in, maybe even if he's um, not right, and I mean the quarterback, but he's got to help defend that kid. OK, and then he's earning he's earning leadership there. He's earning some payback from that kid. That kid knows, OK, he just had my back. He, I, he's sticking up for me. Um, the offensive leader, the quarterback, he's got to talk and talk and talk to his coach. OK, there cannot be any hesitation. He can't be reticent. <clears throat> um, this, I'll just go through this quickly. Three levels of QB play. He could be a game manager, accurate passer, a play extender. And you have to recognize what he does best. That quarterback that I showed you at the beginning, um, his name, John Schaefer, he was a great game manager, decent passer, definitely not a play extender. Okay. So this was Drew Brees in the Super Bowl. Okay. Against the Colts. And um, <clears throat> the reason I brought it up is because I sat there at the game and I sat in the first row in the end zone, and I saw from behind some of the throws that he made, which were just unbelievable. But this was his passer rating. He was 114. Um, he had 40 attempts, 34 completions. So I documented them all. So this is how it started for him. The first pass is complete. The second and the third pass. Second pass was an overthrow. Third pass was a pass breakup. The sixth pass was a drop. Seventh pass was a pass breakup. Then he goes and completes seven in a row or six in a row. He throw, makes an overthrow. Then he goes from um, pass number 14 to pass number 28, and they're all completions. Then on the 29th pass, he has a drop, and then he finishes the game at the critical time with 11 completions. It's really a phenomenal um, result. It's just amazing. And if you saw some of the throws, it's one of those situations where um, you know, it's so hard to teach anticipation and, and being able to watch it from the end zone and watch the ball come out of his hand and say, what are you doing? And then the next thing you know, all of a sudden, there's a receiver running right into the line of the throw. It's just an amazing performance. Anyway, these are things that, um, you know, there's many examples of a great performance. I mean, you could take a, a, a Tom Brady game and break it down for your kid and show it to him. And, and again, Put it out in front of him. What is really good? What are the expectations here? And yeah, maybe he won't be Tom Brady, but Tom Brady was no great athlete. Everybody knows that. And obviously did a lot of work in order to get where he was. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit more with this guy in a bit in terms of mechanics and fundamentals. Tremendous athlete when he played. This is an unbelievable picture. I mean, he's two feet off the ground here making a throw. And um, this is sometimes coach friend talked about this. I call this a catawampus throw, meaning that you're sometimes not going to be in the perfect position to make the throw, um, but you have to find a way to get it done. <clears throat> um, I often take baseball players and watch how they throw in all the awkward positions that they throw from. Obviously, Derek Jeter was an amazing shortstop for the Yankees. And, you know, he's making a throw here that, you know, I would not instruct my kid um, to throw from this position. But as you get into the later stages of a kid's career, um, they have to be able to do this. I, when I was with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, uh, Ken Miller was the head coach. And during um, special teams periods, he would tell me to take the quarterbacks. Darian Durant was our kid at the time, great player. And he'd say, take them down at the other end of the throw, the other end of the field, and make up different throws. Let them make up different throws um, and try to complete them and do it from all types of platforms. 
And um, I, I felt comfortable with that. Obviously, he was a pro player. His basic mechanics were pretty good. And so we felt that, you know, you're not always going to be able to throw from a perfect platform. And this was these were some of the things that we worked on. Um, let me just uh, make sure I know what I'm talking about here. Um, uh, many times when you um, stand behind the quarterback, um, you, let me put it this way. Many times um, you're not going to get reps. I go back to the situation I had at the University of Central Florida. Um, if you're the backup, you have to stand your ground right behind that the starter, okay? Plant your feet there and don't budge and relax and make the decisions um, as he is going through his rep, okay? Um, find opportunities to make choice plays, okay? Read the defense. Don't let a rep go by where you're not allowing, not watching what is happening, okay? This is really an important aspect, um, particularly when you get to the pro level. And I'll, uh, I'll just share this with you. Um, I, you know, I, I coached in the CFL for nine years, and I'm sure it's not much different. I, I saw so many kids come up from the States, and, and I saw Canadian kids as well. And, you know, they do pretty good in practice. But in a um, in a in the first exhibition game, it usually goes like this: they're going to get maybe one or two series, unless they're a big time player. But if they're an add on recruit type of guy, they might get two series, and the chances are things are going to be going for around them so fast that it's going to be two and out, and they don't realize that they're American. And no offense to Americans, but they're going to be playing three down football. The next thing you know, they're punting, and um, they've lost their repetition. They're, they've lost their chance to get another set of downs. And many times I saw that was it. That was all they got. And so you've got to be able to process. You've got to be able to have the chance to process and you can't waste the chance to process. This is the key thing that you have to be able to do is process information as quickly as possible as you play the position. Obviously as a coach, you've got to make that um, situation easy for them, but this is the reality of this position. When you watch videotape, okay, it's where you, on the field, you get to learn and react, okay, but in the video room, this is where you see much of the field, and you see things that you didn't see before, okay, and you view tapes of yourself, okay, and they leaves you knowing that you could do much better, and yet you could see much more, okay, the videotape is really, really critical and you learn from it. Okay. And you've got to be able to, um, you've got to be a, a film room junkie. Whenever you get off the field, you've got to, you know, watch your pass skeleton, watch your team period, watch all the reps that you took and see what you didn't see. Okay. And be able to grade yourself and, and make an analysis of yourself and be critical of yourself. And this is how you learn. Okay. Um, these are things I feel are really important. And Danny talked about these. I'll just get into them um, a little bit, but getting re repetitions on reactions, playing the position. Okay. If you read this line at the bottom, this is probably the key thing until you are reacting to defenders, you're not really learning football. And so I often laugh. And I, you know, when I watch these quarterbacks and who are doing their drills for the combine and, how many of these guys actually make it? They look good in shorts. They drop back. The ball is, you know, the delivery is great. But if you go back and you study the first round picks in the last few rounds, how many of these guys really make it? And so the big thing that you have to realize as a coach, and Danny talked about, it, he had certain things set up for them, thought that was excellent. You have to be able to train your guys to make reactions and, you know, just study the position and use your imagination and develop drills that fit the position. It's, it's really not that hard. Make it specific. But these are different reactions that you can work on. Um, one is to check a delivery at the site of danger. Um, moving forward in a pocket. That was a great video that he showed, and he put a lot of emphasis on that. Moving forward in a pocket when your last choice of the pattern is covered. Are you going to move forward and are you going to run to throw? Or are you going to run to run? OK, key thing there, and he brought it up, was you've got to keep your eyes up and be ready to make a quick pocket reaction. The thing that I 
emphasize is you, you don't have to be a great athlete. It helps if you're a great athlete. But what I tell our kids is you've got to be a pocket athlete. Okay. And that is so critical. And you basically have to understand that you have a cylinder in which to work and you have to be able to move. You make your drop back, your protection is set up to form a cup for you. And then from there, you have to be able to react in that pocket and you have to be a pocket athlete and um, being able to step up into the pocket, um, being able to make a throw on the run is very critical. I used to, as a Canadian coach, time a lot of routes that we did, which was, I think, still got some value. But it's I'm starting to realize what's more important is how the footwork is tied into the route, how the footwork is tied into the progression. This is a window. The feet, to me, are a window to the quarterback's brain. And if I see him hesitating, if I see him taking a double step or whatever, I realize he really doesn't understand the concept. If I see him step up on the right timing, concept isn't open, and then I see him start to run, now I start to I start to have a better feeling that he's had a better pocket reaction, he's a better pocket athlete, or he's doing what I need him to do in the pocket. This is really critical, okay? And being that type of guy that can react and to make decisions, being that pocket athlete, the big thing, okay? Um, being able to throw to a sight-adjusting receiver. Um, Danny had the video there where the quarterback was dropping back. All of a sudden, he's got a guy right in his face. He knows where to go right away. Okay. Um, let me go on here. How do you compete against yourself? Okay. These are different things that you can get numbers on and just work on this. Hit a target. Get your best drop pack. Uh, get, get your best drop time. Uh, fake to certain land box, landmarks. Hand off to one inch of the belly button. Okay. All of these things, little detail things. Okay. Oftentimes you watch quarterbacks, young kids, they make a play action fake, but there's no mesh. There's a two yard separation between the ball and the running back. Okay. You have to have a landmark. And as a coach, you have to be specific and make sure they are doing it properly. Okay. We talked about ball security. I mean, this is why this position is so exciting. Okay. Everything is dependent on how you as a quarterback operate, control the ball, handing the ball off. It seems like a very simple thing, but if you're off by one or two inches, sometimes that can cost you uh, big time in the backfield. Now I I'm sure there's coaches out here that are going to have a hard time with what I'm going to say here, but you have to have, if you work with a quarterback um, and you've got a trust level with him, you have to be able to allow him to take practice, take chances in practice. Okay. I'll, I'll just read this for you. A poker player wins money when he knows he has a hand that will win more than half the time. If he waits for the hand that will win almost every time he loses money. Okay. So if you wait for sure completions, okay, chances are um, you don't give yourself enough chances. Okay. I mean, if you watch what an NFL quarterback is throwing to, it the margin of error is six inches, okay? Now, as a coach, you've got to allow your guy to be able to make these types of throws, make these types of decisions. Obviously, you don't do it um, if there's a, you know, if you're in a progression, there's a player wide open, you take the open player. But at the same time, you've got to be able to encourage him in practice to take risk and understand you know, what is danger? What is, what, where can I get, where can I fit a ball in here? And when can I not fit a ball in here and be able to learn about themselves? Okay. I don't know. That's a hard one for some coaches to handle. I'm sure. Okay. Enhancing um, your image uh, on the field. Okay. This is something I feel, you know, kids have to understand you're the leader of your team and you have to have a certain image. Okay. And again, you're not going to be um, disingenuous, okay? But you're going to work at it. And there's a certain body language that you have to convey when you get into that huddle. Uh, I don't know. Again, I'm maybe talking to an audience here that's very young. I grew up with great admiration of Tom Clemens. I mean, uh, that was my – I still remember him playing in the Sugar Bowl for Notre Dame and, and throwing from the end zone to win the game. And then he comes to the Ottawa Rough Riders. And he makes a play to win the Grey Cup. I mean, two 
unbelievable throws under tremendous pressure, one to win a national championship and one to win a Grey Cup. But if you've ever met this guy, I mean, he is the the probably the quietest person, um, you know, very self-effacing, yeah, you know, just not, you know, the boisterous type or outgoing type, but on the field, he's all business. I mean, there is no doubt about it, he, what his goal is. And just, uh, I'll just elaborate a little bit about him. If you don't know who he was, you should look him up because he's been regarded as the greatest athlete, athlete to come out of Western Pennsylvania. And so when he came out of high school, he had a decision to make whether to go to North Carolina to be a point guard on the basketball team for Dean Smith or to go to Notre Dame and be a quarterback. And that just tells you the type of uh, athlete he was. Uh, and so, I mean, he grew up in an area where there's tremendous quarterbacks uh, that came from there. Joe Montana, Joe Namath. If you've ever been in that area, it's just unbelievable. The, the history of quarterbacks that came from there, but he was regarded as a great athlete, one of the greatest athletes ever. But anyway, this is things that he was able to do as a, um, as a quarterback during the game on the field. Okay. I mean, just read through it, look at down the distance markers and the scoreboard. Okay. As you wait for the play to come in, you got to say something to a teammate, turn your head to study the defense, speak to the referee, call the play with eye contact and command, check the shape of the formation at the line of scrimmage. These are all things that um, people take for granted. Okay. And we're talking about a position of leadership and you as a coach, you have to, I mean, these drills are great, but again, this guy has to, he has to embody this. He has to live this. I mean, you've got to be able to change the play or an aspect of the play by yelling to the faces of the defenders, point, nod, give signals. Okay. Naturally, as you talk, you may, in your offense, you may have this, um, these things that are required, but you know, if you never get a chance to do it, you know, you have to be able to practice it. And then you have to show a killer instinct when your opponent's reeling. Okay. How do you enhance your um, play, your image off the field? And this is, you know, some people may look at this and say, I'm crazy. But for me, this guy is the guy that's the, he's the flagship of your program. Everybody knows who the head coach is. Everybody knows who the quarterback is. And if they don't, they're going to ask. Okay. And so they want to see a guy, <clears throat> pardon me. They want to see somebody who's representative of your program. Okay. He's going to be front and centers front and center. So things that are going to happen, other players can't get themselves together. There are things they cannot stop doing. They abandon efforts to improve. Their playbooks look brand new. They do nothing with um, exactitude. They can't even act collected, but you as a quarterback, you're different. You've got your act together. Okay. They have to hang in groups and banter about frivolous things. You don't do these things alone. Okay. You imbibe praise or pardon me. They imbibe praise. You are you're not looking for praise not necessarily. You dress conservatively and well at all time. Your football uniform fits and you look like a football player and you act older than you are. Um, you do not look around the group to see who's there. The other, around, the other people around you are looking to see if you are there. Um, you have mature relationships that you don't date. You greet your elders cheerfully. The wives of the coaches love you. When a guy joins the team, you get his name and shake his hand. Uh, you write notes of sympathy and appreciation. You visit people who are down. I, I mean, I know these are things that, um, you know, we're talking football here, but as a quarterback, this is front, this is really, really important. Okay. Um, you're a good student, but your investment in quarterbacking is not less than what it is in academics. I, I told the kids that I worked with that, you know, I expected them to do well in school. That was a priority. But they had to do, they had to plan time for an extra class. And that was my class. And it was year round. And basically, if they didn't want to, I mean, that was part of the pitch when I recruited them. Okay. There is one other pursuit that you are known for. You fish or keep a diary or you work at a soup kitchen. And you are tough and you're as tough as anyone. And I can't emphasize that enough. Okay. It's easy for the press to write about you. Above all, you appear to be saving your best for the test on the field, okay? There is a look about people who face periodic tests, okay, where they must be at their very best. And this is where um, fighter pilots, surgeons, baseball pitchers, they all have this um, calling at some point 
they're going to have to be ready for this test and they have to be ready to go and they have a certain look about them. <clears throat> um, this is another thing I think is really important about saying the right things. Okay, I'll get the job when I'm the best. Right now, Alex is performing better than I am. The one thing you really, you know, he, he's got to earn favor with his team and he's got to be able to say the right things all the time. And you've got to be able to coach him on this and you've got to be proactive on this stuff. Everyone is responsible for the pass protection, not just the blockers. I've got to get the ball out on time. What's my favorite play? It means it takes a knee. That means we won. Um, coach records sacks by who is primarily to blame. My concern is the list with my name above it. Okay. Um, anyway, these are often uh, other things that they can, um, you know, that you, I think you guys get the point where, where I'm going with this, this attitude is, is really, really important. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I wanted to show some video and, um, I have some drills. I have a lot of other video as well. Um, I was going to get into this, but maybe I should show some video first to um, maybe change pace. Is that okay, Paul? Yeah, it's whatever you want to do. Okay. And I'm going to get back to this and um, I'll, I'll show this. Now, let me see here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to hit escape. So when I hit escape, I don't get out of my... Um, my yeah, so you'll need to... Uh, uh, stop your screen share and then select the you said dv sport there you go yeah, i have a dv sport um video here yeah so now Can you see my screen? screen not yet not yet and then when you select your dv sport um select select optimize video Can you see that? Not yet, no. How about now? No. Like Verizon. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Verizon. <laughs> so I just hit share screen. Yeah, share screen and select your um, DV Sport uh, video that's showing on the one option. How about that? No, nothing yet. We may have to call in Chris Colson. No. Are you hitting the, the green share screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it is start TV sport over. Okay. It's not hard. So I probably put everybody to sleep with that dissertation, I guess. <laughs> no, that was good stuff. Totally good stuff, Coach. Let's see here. I didn't notice you had the swag on you there, Coach. What's that? He's got the, he's got the Waterloo stuff on him. Waterloo. What do you got on there? Oh, no, it says gross grind. No, no, no. Oh, gross grind. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Dwayne had that on. Yeah. Sorry, uh, dude. Warrior Fields. Warrior Gear. Yeah. <laughs> the Grouse Grind. Oof. Love that place. It's worth getting up there, I can tell you that. But mm -hmm. the journey's not fun. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was the biggest guy going up the mountain that day. Can you see that? No, still not. Really? really? Darn it. Okay, so I'm I'm hitting share screen. Yep. Okay. And now I'm going to DV Sport. 
You don't see it. No. no. Try try going share screen back to your PowerPoint and see see if that's at least coming up. Maybe it's still a DV Sport issue with your computer. Do you see that? Yeah, see that popped up right away. Now try it again. Go back, exit out of that, and try going to your DV Sport again. How's that? Still in your uh, PowerPoint. This will do it. There you go. Okay. You got it. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm going to talk in terms of training. Uh, this is a kid in grade 10. And um, uh, I'll just explain a little bit. Um, uh, when I when I got out on the field with him in November, um, I could see a really good athlete and there was all kinds of flaws and um, still got flaws. Um, I think as a coach, you have to be able to be imaginative and deal with the flaws and try to work on certain things. And so I did a lot of, I don't know if anybody's heard of Tom house. He was the, he's the pitching coach that um, he worked with a lot of quarterbacks. He's worked with Tom Brady. And so one of the key things for me, um, and what he brought up a lot was being able to have a high elbow. And um, this was something that's been stressed to me. And I, myself, I, as, and I played the position and I really, um, I really buy into this. You notice right here, his elbow is above his shoulder and it's about, I, I don't know what exact, how high it is, but this is a really key thing for me to have them have this high elbow. Okay. And so when they're doing this cord, it's not only that they're stretching their shoulder and they're actually mimicking the action. Okay. But they're getting the elbow out in front and they're getting the elbow at the right position. And oftentimes with little kids, you'll see them with the low elbow and not coming right over the top. That's just one aspect of this. Okay. And so we do this every day. And basically, it's just a bungee cord or something you might take to yoga class or something like that. And um, very simple um, thing to do. But it really does help to kind of install in him. And, and this is the thing. I'll say this as well. Um, I'm going to show a certain way to throw. And I feel it's the right way to throw. Uh, I do feel there's other ways to throw. And I see a lot of kids throw the other way. And if the ball spins and if it goes well, I'm not going to mess with them, but I'm dealing with a kid right here who's still in the formative stages and I'm going to try to make them do it right. And what I'm going to stress here is a high elbow and being able to, and I'll talk about other things in a moment in reference to other players, but this is one thing I feel is really important. Um, if I, there's a couple, um, one thing I do every day and unfortunately it didn't, this thing, the one drill didn't show up is I make sure that they warm up from their knee. And I'm not talking about the kids that I had um, in the CFL or at university, but with this guy, I'm going to make him warm up in such a way that it's going to be a progression that he activates certain pot parts of his body from top down. And throwing from his knee is the first part. And what I need him to do is I need him to pose in a proper carrying position of the ball and then make the throw and rotate his shoulders. So we are activating the shoulders and we are using the hand. The next thing I ask him to do is stand up and throw from a foot parallel position. And if you notice my screen, it says knee drill and foot parallel. Unfortunately, I was not able to recover those two um, drills. Okay. But then the next part of the drill is to go to the anchor drill. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just changed the drill. And so what I'm asking him to do here is I'm asking him to get anchored. And I'll just tell you this, like if you do this properly and what I, I really stress um, all of the, um, the checkpoints when he does this, I need him to carry the ball properly. I need him to have his, I call this his ankle eye right here. Okay. Can you see my, my writing? Okay. I need that right ankle to be perpendicular to the target. Okay. I need to have this line set up 
so that it matches the line of his throw. And I often, I, you know, I explained to him perpendicular and uh, he didn't know what I was talking about. And um, then, uh, you know, I get into a long story about they don't teach math anymore and all this stuff. But anyway, bit of a joke. But anyway, I need to see a good knee bend front and back. I need to see the ball carried on his right breastplate. I need to see the left shoulder pointing at the target. And I, what, what we're doing from here is we're starting a kinematic chain. Okay. We are pushing off of this right foot. The right hip is going to turn. We're going to move in a circle. Okay. This left shoulder is going to turn. The right shoulder is coming around and he's going to leave the ball behind and he's going to drive the ball. Now you can't tell right here, but this is about 25 yards and he's going to, you, you watch this ball jump out of his hand. Okay. I mean, this ball is moving and I, I'll be honest with you. I do this drill and and I'm not, I'm not kidding. This kid does not want to catch me. Okay. And I'm 64 years old, but I can still throw with a lot of power and it's nothing to do with my arm. And what I'm really emphasizing here is I don't want any leaks. I need to see that left shoulder and that left elbow tight. I need to see a good rotation. And what you notice is a lot like what coach was talking about was there is really no step here. And we call this an anchor drill, okay, because he's anchored. And what I need him to be able to get the feel of is when you get to the top of your drop in the pocket, you are in this position. You are in an anchored position, and you really don't need to step and throw. It's all a matter of a good um, uh, hip turn, shoulder turn, right about here. Let me just back up a little bit, okay? Just go, sorry, okay? But right about here. The ball is behind and it needs to catch up with the rest of the body and you've created a torque. Okay. So this is an anchor drill and he, by doing this and by me emphasizing all of the different um, checkpoints, tight elbow, um, ball high, get the ball up and over your shoulder, your, your shoulder up. Okay. Throw your belt buckle out at the target. All of these things. Um, he can really feel a, a, Great sense of power. This is a kid that's 6'2 or 6'3. I have no idea what he's going to do in the pocket, but he is he is de delivering the ball as well as anybody I've seen. Okay? And this is a really – you when you do this drill, you really get a feel for it. I mean, he's got two kids there that can catch. They're really good players, and he's putting it through their hands. And there's no effort there. Now, I, this is from the side, and you know it looks awkward here, but I need to see him have the knee bend. I need to see him come off his back foot, okay? And I need to really see the whole shoulder turn and the good high elbow. And what's more important to me is, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but there's no wasted motion behind the ear. The draw is what I'm talking about. When the hands separate, I call that the draw, and the ball is going right to his ear. It's going up and out, okay? And it's coming out. And I encourage him in this drill to throw with anger. And when I say that, just use your body. Don't worry about your arm and just throw, you know, and get good velocity. So you get a feel for the type of velocity you can get. But there's no wasted motion there. There's no dropping the ball, okay? It's a good high elbow, um, the, uh, the ball is left behind. Okay. Let me show you another part of this. Um, okay. Uh, one thing coach was talking about was throwing the quick game and getting the ball out fast. One thing, and, and I talked to him later after I videoed this and, um, uh, you know, I didn't hold the camera right. That's why you're seeing the wrong angle here. But anyway, uh, I, I tell quarterbacks, never put the ball in your right hand. Always snap the ball, throw the ball up to yourself. He's got a tendency right now to place the ball. He's got the grip like he wants it. He's got a claw on it right now. And that's not the realistic picture. You need to place the ball in your left hand, toss it, put it up in your right hand, and then get the ball out. And this is, you know, you have to repeat that drill or have somebody snap it to him. Now, this is for quick game. And you saw on Coach Friend's um, video, he showed a lot of this. And this is how I drill and give them the idea. 
everything starts with their feet. And often when I, I started this with him, he was taking big steps. And, you know, when you're throwing quick game and you're in 50 protection or 360 protection, rather, um, you don't have a lot of space in the pocket. You've got to pick up your feet, redirect, okay, and get the ball out. And so we use a hula hoop as a reference. And I'll say this in November, I mean, he was doing these steps and he was, I'm exaggerating, but he was almost out to the street with his steps. But you've got to be able to just do it in place. And so the idea here is to pick up, get your right ankle in, in line with your throw perpendicular. And that's about as, even here, he's a bit too much with his right foot. I just need to see him pick it up and redirect it. But that's how we drill them on a uh, quick game. Yeah, these steps here, um, I think, are a bit too big, but still, he gets the reference. Uh, Again, the thing that I like is the fact that he's carrying the ball high and the ball goes straight up and out. There's no wasted motion behind his ear. It's up and out. Now, the thing I'm emphasizing to him, what I want him to do is when he follows through is to come down to his hip pocket and you can do a towel drill where you have somebody stand out in front of him and he has a towel and he comes over top and he hits your hand with the towel. But what this follow through here, I'm not really happy with. I'd like to see it come down to the hip pocket. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that he gets his chest and his shoulders over his knee. Okay. I, and bring that hand to the opposite pocket, not across his body. And this is something I've been working on for quite some time with him. Okay. Now I'm going to show you. Um, here we go. Okay. So I don't know if you know this guy. But this is when he was playing in college. I'll just throw this in here. So this is Joe Namath. And people don't realize, you know, what a great athlete he was, how fast he was, et cetera. Um, tremendous athlete. I'll just let you watch a couple clips here. Famous for jump pass. But to me, he had probably the purest motion of anybody. He and I tried to get Dan Marino video, and I couldn't get it on here. This happened to be the place, the, the play that he first got hurt. Uh, he had a knee problem, his right knee. Okay, so now he's in the NFL. And so the thing that I want you to be able to see here is basically he's getting himself into the anchored position, okay, on all of his throws. Okay, notice that, you know, he hits that back foot, okay, and now it's a matter of the kinematic chain starting, pushing off the back foot, hip turn, shoulder turn, the ball follows, and it's out. Notice that when he does take the ball and, and he starts to draw, it goes right up to his ear. It's up and out. And again, you'll watch some guys, and I don't want to start pointing them out. Drew Brees is one, though. But the ball will, um, you know, they'll flick their wrist and all that kind of stuff. Here's a perfect picture here, okay? And Coach Friend was talking about this. He hits his back foot, and right away he starts the action forward. Okay, two hands on the ball, okay, and – Right away, the ball is out, pardon me, up and out. And um, the back foot hits, and then the rotation starts. And I mean, this takes a lot of work. I mean, he was a great athlete. Not a, you know, not a, if you look at his body, he wasn't like a big muscle man. He's just getting a lot done with the, the mechanics of his body. These guys were coaches and players that would talk about when he when he threw, you could hear the ball come off his hand. 
And when you are, if you're a coach, that's one thing you can look for is, you know, and I, as a recruiter, I was never going to take a kid unless I could stand beside him and watch him throw. I needed to be able to stand beside him, watch him throw and listen to the ball. And I know that may not sound proper, but the ball is going to come off his hand with a certain flick. And then it's going to start to whistle in the air. And you can see this. I mean, he's getting right over top. And I mean, that ball is coming. So anyway, that's uh, an example of good. Here's another example here. Um, and this is where my computer blew up. But, and I think you know who this guy is. And the one thing that he's great for is finding the anchored position. Okay. And there's hardly any step. And the one thing that he used to be a catcher. And if you ever get a chance, watch a catcher throw the ball down to second base. Okay. I mean, they're amazing how fast the ball gets out. Okay. So if you just watch his action from there, the ball goes straight. He's carrying it and it goes straight up to the loaded position and there's no wasted motion behind his ear. He's throwing it to second base and he's turning in the, hopefully you get another picture of it when he's throwing from the, here we go. No, here. Okay. You'll see it right here. Again, the ball is, you know, he's carrying it a little low here and, but the ball is getting right up to the um, behind his ear and everything else gets in front of his elbow. Okay, very little step forward, good good weight transfer from the right um, foot to the left foot, good um, hip turn. And the phrase I use is throw your belt buckle at the target. Okay, and you can isolate this part of the throw by just having him throw with just a hip turn. Okay, and then the next thing that's happening is the shoulder turn and um, then the elbow follows. Um, again, I mean, for me as a recruiter, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm beside a guy and I'm going to watch him throw. I'm going to see how the ball. Anyway, there's a couple of pictures there. I want to go back to something here. Can you see my PowerPoint? No, it's still on your DV sport. You'll okay. So let me do this. Hopefully I can do this a little bit more efficiently. Stop share. Share screen. Can you see it? No, not yet. Not yet. What do you see now? Uh, just us, still. Pardon me? Just us. No, uh, no screen share. Okay. So, um, Give me some coaching here. Help me out. What do I need to do? Uh, so you're in full yeah, screen right now. Can you see the toolbar to see share screen? Hit your green share screen button. Yep. And then choose your PowerPoint presentation that, that well, if you have it open. There you go. Okay. That's it. Okay. So um, I'm going to go through, uh, when I was with um, Winnipeg, uh, Paul Lapo and I, we went to visit um, Green Bay and um, Tom Clemens was the coordinator. And he gave us this document that basically it's what, what a phys ed teacher would use, but it charted um, whatever drop that you wanted to have. Okay. And so what it is, is a profile. And what he told us, what he did was at the beginning of their um, OTAs, they, at that time, um, they were able to have these people for quite some time. And basically they were in like a four week or five week program. And so they videoed um, different drops with different throws. And then what he did was he would like a phys ed teacher, he would mark them and critique each movement within that drop. And I think this is something that's really, um, you know, at the pro level, obviously it's very valuable at a young level. It's really, really valuable to help um, with all of the basic mechanics of throwing and dropping back. 
And so, you know, there wouldn't be, you know, he, at the time he was working with Aaron Rodgers. Brett Favre wouldn't take part in this. Um, and he said there really wasn't many things that he needed to do. But with the other guys, there would be certain th- comments that he would make and that there would be adjustments made. So if you just bear with me here, what he's talking about on this one, for instance, and you could adjust this however you want. This was a three-step hitch and throw um, setup. Okay. And so you would first thing you would do is comment about the getaway, the reach, the crossover, and you would make comments about the type of control and the finish. And then you would make comments about the depth of the drop, the plant, and how your target foot was set up. Okay. And maybe as you looked at 10 reps, for instance, there might be something that shows up consistently that needed to be commented about. But you as a coach, you as a teacher would have a criteria that you would want to see on each of these um, parts of the mechanic. And you would comment about it. You would tell them what the expectations are. Um, If you didn't have those expectations, you would make a comment. Okay. And then you go into um, the throwing fundamentals of the drop. So how does he carry the ball? Where's the height? Where is it in the body frame? Is there two hands on the ball? What happens with the draw, which I am so concerned about? What is the course of the draw? The draw again being when the hands separate and where does the ball go? And I know you can't see me, but some people will take the ball and have a draw where they are looping it well underneath and as you know, going in a roundabout cir- circular type of fashion, and then it comes out and they're very effective with it. Myself, if I'm dealing with a young kid like I was, I'm going to try to get them to te- you get the ball and start the draw and get it up to the ear and out. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that. Wrist rotation, a common problem with young kids is they may cup the ball and you may see them take a ball. And one thing you may want to do is make sure they have the right size ball in their hand. Don't give them an oversized ball. If you ever look at the old CFL balls, they were just huge and they're difficult to hold. But what you want to make sure is that they, the analogy I use is that they are make like they are carrying a pan of pizza and their hand is open. Okay. And that instead of being cupped, and I don't know if you can see me where the point is pointing down, but get the point pointing up and make like you're carrying a pan of pizza and you know, you have your left hand supporting that. Okay. And then what is the angle that they're taking to the high point? And then obviously you want to be on a straight angle, Okay, and then you want to critique their front shoulder. And, um, you know, is it pointing? Where is it pointing? Where do you want it to point? Okay, Um, what happens when you start the motion? What happens with the left hand? What happens with the left elbow? What happens with the point of release and the things that you need to look at? I mentioned to you already are, you know, the height of the ball, elbow flexibility. Okay, many kids are so tight that when they come across and they throw, their elbow is less than 90 degrees. If you watch the pitcher, okay, or you watch a good quarterback, he's opened their elbow beyond 90 degrees and it's high, okay? And then where is his line, his target line? Um, Is he going in the line of his throw? All of these things really, really critical that you could critique. If you can do what I did, and I did this with our kids as I put them on video. And I mean, we were, you know, this was obviously part of our, winter program with kids, you know, I was going to video them and get this up on DV sport and let them see it. And I would critique it. And then the next thing that you look at is the follow through. Okay. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but you know, hip, shoulders, elbow. Okay. The, the transfer, the arm, all of these things, what's happening with the back foot, what's happening with the ball and the fingers. And um, you know, is the ball, if he throws enough, his palm and he lets the ball go properly, the, the thing that you emphasize is that the palm is down and the thumb is out and the ball comes off his index finger. I'll show you a picture in a minute and you can hear the ball come off his index finger. Um, Really critical. Uh, There's a clicking sound. And then the last thing you do is you want to see if he's spinning the ball properly. Is it a spiral? Um, What type of movement is it? How much velocity does he have? And not that velocity is the key thing, but, the, the thing that I'm emphasizing here, are there any leaks in his motion? Is he, is he extending his left arm out? Is he getting his left hip um, or is he flying his shoulder out of, out of the position so that he's got leaks and he's losing power? 
all of these things are important. And there are times you ask him to throw with velocity, and this is what you're checking for, to make sure that he's a coiled spring. Okay, uh, I'll just do this, show you this just as a little bit of a joke. Um, one of my favorite drills is um, if we're throwing an out route against air, okay, I need to see the ball. First of all, I'm going to put a garbage can right here, 40 yards downfield. He's going to take a three-step hit and throw. And if the ball is not thrown here or outside, he has to run and tackle the garbage can. Because if the ball is thrown inside, that means the DB is going to make a play on it. And you better be running, son. Okay? So we need we do the garbage can drill um, when we're throwing routes against air. And they hate it. They hate me for it. But it serves a point. And oftentimes they're going to miss. They get too many misses out here. Then I have to, okay, now listen, let's get some completions here. Okay. So anyway, let me go back. Okay. Um, I haven't talked about the grip. I, I, I mean, the thing about the grip is that you're going to find kids, all kids, you're not going to find the same grip with everybody. They all have different size hands. Key thing is to hold it light enough. Okay, that there's space underneath the palm or above the palm. Okay, they don't want to pack the ball into the palm. You want to spread your fingers evenly across the ball. Um, you want to make sure your thumb and your index finger are opposite each other. And for me, my ring finger is the only finger that's on the laces. Okay, I've seen guys, Terry Bradshaw, could, he'd have his point, his index finger on the point and the baby finger beyond the laces, big hands, okay? But what this picture shows is how the ball is supposed to come off your fingers, and um, it should be coming off your your baby finger, then your um, ring finger, then the middle finger, and then lastly, your index finger. And your index finger pushes down on the panel, and it should cause an upward rotation to the right, okay? And when it does that, if it hits the wall, it's going to bounce backwards to the left. So anyway, um, one thing as a coach you want to um, try to do, and I'm sure many of you might be golfers, I don't know, but when you come and approach a golf ball, you have certain thoughts that you have. And the better golfers have limited the amount of thought that they have before striking the ball to maybe one or two things. Um, Tom Brady would talk about ball carry, elbow, hip pocket. That would be it. So what he's talking about here is how he's carrying the ball on the breastplate. The next thing is getting the elbow up. Okay. And then the last thing he'd think about is get the hand to the hip pocket. That would, that would um, start the motor program. Basically that would be it. And once that was done and once that's activated, it's out. But if he has a lot of throw thoughts, okay. And he goes to pass skeleton you've got problems. So you've got to make sure you rep him and make sure he's got this down to a certain science. Okay. And so that he becomes, it mean it becomes automatic. Um, this will, let me ask you the people here. Cause I know what time is it? It's 10 o'clock. Would somebody rather me talk about some concepts or would you rather me talk about, um, this is a, uh, a shot, a, a frame by frame collage, I guess, of Joe Namus throw. Would you rather me talk about that? Or would you rather me explain some concepts? I'm good with vote. whichever. Somebody was about to say something, go for it. Yeah, I vote for uh, mechanics. Mechanic. We talk about yeah. concepts all the time, but mechanics is always... Okay. We never so, spent enough on it. Okay. Well, if I were, if, and I'm not sure what level you coach at, but if I'm coaching, I, I show this to all the guys that I coach. And again, I feel like his delivery was one of the best of all time. And even though this is outdated and this is grainy black and white, this is a really good illustration of what it means to have a pure quick release. And so what there is here are, 16 slides and it goes through the throwing motion, one throwing motion. 
And the first slide is from the side. The second slide is the same frame, but from the front. And then it goes from side to front, side to front. And you can see basically what I'm trying to show here is the athleticism and what I talk about as a kinematic chain, okay? There's a chain that's going through his right leg and it's being transferred to the hips, shoulders, arm, and then being distributed back to the left. And like the golf swing, if it's synchronous, you can create a lot of power. And again, I, 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 will, I will put any money on this with anybody here that if you came out and threw with me, I would rip your hands off. And I'm 64 years old and from 25 yards, I will kill you, I swear to God. Cause I can still, I can still hum it. And um, I'm not trying to brag, but the one thing that I do is I try to stay loose and I, you know, yoga, but at the same time, I'm trying to make sure I don't have any power leaks and I don't have, I'm not strong, but I'm using my body. And I would venture that anybody, if they can do this, if they can keep the, the synchrony, you would be able to throw with power as well. Um, and maybe, and obviously a lot more power than what I would have. Okay. So anyway, if I just go through this, then, um, you know, the one thing that we'll talk about is where does he carry the ball? He used, you should have two hands on the ball and it should be comfortable and his elbow should hang down and it should be at the breastplate on his right breastplate. If you notice, he's got all of the weight on the right foot. He's got a good knee bend. Okay. This left shoulder, you're going to see it. Um, it's going to be cocked a little bit, but his eyes are downfield. Okay. And there's balance here. Okay. Um, go to the next picture. So this is the same shot from the front. Okay. And what I'd like to point out to you is that there is a, there is like a coiling of that left shoulder. Okay. It's not exactly straight at the target. And maybe this is something particular to him, but he is starting to get coiled right here. Okay. Again, weight is on the back foot and he's starting to transfer to the front. <coughs> Two hands on the ball, eyes downfield. Okay. He's just starting to make his hip turn. Okay. So now we're into the second slide. Um, he still hasn't separated his hands. His hips have started to open a little bit more. Okay. There is a bit of a weight transfer here and he's pushing the ball back and up. Okay. Still weight on the right foot, but there's transfer. Okay. Again, the chin is downfield. Okay. Same picture from the, um, from the front. Okay. And you can see that uh, again, the hands are starting to go up. I think I'm out of sequence here. I missed the front view too. Sorry about that, but still think you get the right idea here. Okay. Um, he's starting to raise up. Left shoulder still cocked. His, um, he's kind of searching to plant his left foot. Notice that the right angle is perp or the right ankle is perpendicular to his target line. Okay. Okay. So this is the side view three. Again, he's progressing. He's straightening, straightening the, the back knee. Okay. There's a bit more turn here. Ball is getting higher. Again, left shoulder pointing to his target. Okay. Um, this is one thing that's important for me is that this left elbow and this left hand doesn't get out too far. It's like, I know uh, when I was a kid, you used to look at the pictures on the Wheaties box and the quarterback would have his left arm out. And that just cuts down all of the angular momentum that you would like to create. I talked about this last week briefly about the figure skater. When they want to go, they spin fast, they're tucked in. Okay. When they are want to slow down, they open up their arms. It's what they call moment of inertia. You don't need to know what that stuff is. Just take it for granted. Take it for, that, That's what's happening. You want to make sure that you're nice and tight. Okay, this is the, far, the fourth picture from the front. Okay, I'm, we're out of sequence a little bit. I'm sorry, I should have checked that. But anyway, um, you can see where this left shoulder uh, and left elbow are starting to pull a little bit. And the, th the phrase that I use with this left ankle is he's starting to frame his target. And um, if you noticed on the video that I had with um, the young man there, he 
had his left foot pointed outwards to the left, or pardon me, he was framing his target. This left foot was not really down the middle. And if you place it right down the middle, then you're going to lock your hips out. But by opening his hips a little bit, you are allowing your hips to turn. Okay. And that's a tremendous power source. Okay. So now we're getting to the point where I talk about quite a bit. Notice where the ball is now. Okay. It's up above the, the uh, it, it's behind the ear. It's been raised straight up. There's been no motion where it's come down around like that, but it's straight to the ear like a back catcher would throw down the second base. Okay. And now you can see a great hip turn, more weight on that front foot. Okay. The left foot is pointing straight ahead, but he's framed a target. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit, but okay. Again, a hip turn. Okay. The ball is left behind. The shoulders are starting to turn. Okay. And he's really creating a lot of torque here. Okay. Okay. The next view from the front. Okay. The left arm continues. Okay. To pull um, the body weight goes from right to left. Again, you could see where he's landed on his left foot. He's coming off his back foot now. Okay. And the shoulders are starting to come forward and the ball. Here's a phrase that you should try to catch onto is the ball is left behind. Okay. And what has to happen as he turns those shoulders and his hips, the ball suddenly, suddenly has to catch up. Okay. So you'll see it more vividly in the next couple of pictures right here, for instance. Okay. You can see where he has become a coiled spring. Okay. Tremendous strength. Um, well, a lot of weight on that front foot. He's off the back foot. The belt buckle is now at the target. When, what did I say? Throw your belt buckle at the target. The shoulders are out in front. The elbow is now in front of the ball. He's left the ball behind his ear, and now he has to make the ball catch up with the rest of his body. And right through here, from here to the, all these obliques and through the legs, this is where you create a lot of um, power. This is your source of power. Um, I mean, guys will go in the weight room and ask, what do I do to strengthen my arms? Squats would be very important. Okay, being able to lift, being able to find your anchor position, your athletic position, and be able to move out of that position, really kind of a critical thing. I mean, you could do things to strengthen your arm by working on your rotator cuff. Um, I can, if anybody wants, I can send them some exercises for that. Uh, but anyway, let's continue on. This is from the front. Okay, and you can see where every, now he's starting to move the ball forward. You can see the critical thing for me now is that the left ankle is framing the target. Okay. I like to say that his left hand is biting the burger. Okay. That he's kept it tight. Okay. And we don't want the left hand way out in front or extended the elbow extended. We want him to keep it tight. So the shoulder doesn't fly. And now the elbow is the critical thing. And when you're doing the knee drill, when you're throwing from your knee, what I do oftentimes is I take a golf club and I place a golf club right under their shoulder and I make them throw and get their elbow above the shoulder. Um, let me just go scroll forward for a minute here. Okay. Does everybody see that? Yeah, we got you. Okay. So this was, um, uh, call it the baby. And when I was at certain schools in the States, we use this. And if I could just take a minute to explain what this is, these are wheels. Okay. And they're about six inches in diameter. Okay. These are metal struts that are about six feet tall and there's hinges here. Okay. And on top of these, on these, um, rails is, garden hose that is about a foot and a half. So the quarterback during pass skeleton would stand right here and then he would drop. And basically what this is, is a pocket. Okay. And so the key thing is a pocket like he would have in a game or in team drills. So he would drop back. And the key thing, if he throws with a low elbow, he's going to have problems getting the ball over this, um, the baby. Okay. 
if he has a good high elbow, he'll be able to, it forces him to for, get his elbow up. And you can, this is one way of doing it. It used to drive me crazy at the schools that we were at, that I was at. Because every time we go to pass skeleton, you'd have to get the managers to roll out the baby. It took time. The head coach is yelling at you, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it was very effective. And um, anyway, the other way, the other thing you could do is stand right beside him when he throws and make him bring his elbow above his his shoulder. Okay. Um, if he's doing the knee drill, get a get a golf club and place it underneath his shoulder and make his elbow get above the shoulder. Key thing for young kids, they don't understand that stuff. And um, uh, it really, that's where you get your power. Uh, okay, so that's where I was left off at. Um, this is the next picture. Okay, again, um, you know, if you had a chance to show somebody this, it may be a really good illustration of what they need to do. And then let them, then video them and compare them. Let them have a chance to look at this and see how they compare. But this is a really good picture. Nice high elbow. Everything is has been left behind, and now the ball is caught up to um, the rest of his body and is now trailing the elbow. The elbow is out in front. And so I, I know we have women on this call, and uh, I don't want to – I don't want any repercussions, but the phrase was throw like a girl. Um, that's not what's happening here. I'm sorry. Anyway, I hope I'm not – I'm stepping on any toes, but you by that we mean you've got to lead with your elbow, okay, and get your elbow out in front. And then from there, um, this is really critical. You notice where he's coming off his back foot, different, uh, different um, thoughts on should he be stationary with his back foot? Should he come off his back foot? Um, I don't have a strong opinion on it myself. I do feel that's what's really important here is his chest and his head is over his front knee and his head is directly in front or in the direction of his throw. And he's balanced when he completes his throw. The other thing that's really important is if you look at his palm, uh, the phrase that I use is that your palm is down and your thumb is out. And that's how you should end up. And one thing that kids have problems with many times is that, um, their, their hand will come through and they're not working on the ball properly. If you get your elbow up high enough, your hand can work on the ball. And that means you're getting over top of the ball and you can put the right spin on the ball if your hand works properly. And that means palm down, thumb out, and just let it spin. Um, if a guy is having a problem spinning it, it's usually because it's not rotate. It's not coming off the fingers in the right sequence. And what you could tell him to do is just almost like hitting a foul shot, hold the ball. I had a ball here, but anyway, hold the ball open and then just extend and extend and let your hand work the, on the ball, palm down, thumb out. And, you know, eventually they get the, the ability to spin it. Have them lie down on the ground, have them lie down on the ground and, and spin the ball and, push it upwards. If they're doing it properly, the ball will come down or it will go up and come straight down um, right on top of them. They won't have to move to get the ball. The other thing that will happen if they're right-handed is that the ball will be pointed upwards to the right. And if they're doing it, they should just extend their hand and hold it out there. <clears throat> okay. So again, this is a, another side view and this is that we're almost at the end of the throw you can see a really good picture of his hand, palm down, thumb out. He's got full extension. He's on his front knee. His hip is well in, is turned right around. Okay. And the phrase I start, I use is he has gone from left shoulder to right shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. Okay. Left shoulder started at the target, right shoulder ended at the target. Okay. And then um, the final view from the front, you can see where um, this is a little skewed here. But um, the big thing is that is he's got a good follow through. He extended his hand out. This is the towel drill that I'm talking about. And his hand is down to the, um, uh, to the hip pocket. You can see the left elbow extending out behind him. He's got a good hip turn. 
and his right shoulder is pointing at the target. Okay. And then the last one, um, there you go. Okay. And uh, in the body, you can see it's gone full in the straight around. Um, not bad for a guy that played at Alabama. Okay. So a thing that you have to emphasize is this is all circular motion, circular motion with the hips, circular motion with the shoulders. Okay. And this is a, a great illustration of how he's going from shoulder to shoulder. Okay. He starts with his left shoulder at the target. I don't know if you can make this out. Can you make this out, Paul? Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's a stop action shot. He starts here with the ball up at his, um, at his ear and with his left shoulder pointed to the target. And then he's come through, you can see his palm is down and out. And then he ends up with the right shoulder at the target and the left shoulder back. Um, this is a good illustration that you want to get, end up with the chest over the knee. And when you do the towel drill, you could um, almost overemphasize that and, you know, come out, flick the towel and, you know, really, get your chest right on top of your knee, which is really an over exaggeration. This is the thing that really critical for me. And, you know, um, Danny, uh, you know, said, you know, a thing that's very true. He's throwing a lot of things where the ball is getting out fast. And the key thing is um, if this is, this is fast to me, you notice if you could see this, where the ball starts, it's right here. And then it's getting right up and now it's out. Okay. And there's no waste in motion behind here. Now these guys in the NFL that, you know, will flick the ball and all that kind of stuff, you know, they've got tremendous arm talent, but for a young guy, you know, you want to tell them it's like you're throwing down a second base. You can't waste any time, get it up and out. And this is a great illustration. And this is why I use him as an example of maybe the prototype of what a good throwing motion should be like. And if you've got a young kid, um, you can see, uh, you could work with that. I don't know if you noticed that kid that I had there, but I mean, he, there is no waste in motion with that kid. And um, I, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but it wasn't like that in November. And I caught him early enough there. And again, if you're at a university level, you know, you, you deal with what you deal with the power leaks as best you can. And you try to minimize those but it's hard to really change the draw unless you're like doing a Tiger Woods swing change of six months of supervised um, swings or throws. <clears throat> okay. So this is what I mean by framing the throw. And if you watch what happens here um, in this sequence, you watch what's going to happen with the ball and the left foot. So this is the first picture, okay? And you want to make you want to think about this as if he's throwing down a tunnel, and the ball is basically on one side of the tunnel, and uh, there's a as the ball goes up, okay, and you draw a line to the target, that will define the outer right edge of the target. The left foot, on the other hand, is um, going to the other side of the target. And if you drew a line there, that would define the left side of the target. And in fact, what you're getting is a tunnel, okay? Or you're framing the target. So as you watch this, okay, you can see where his left foot, if you drew a straight line, now we can't see the target, but the left foot is going to the, the left side of the uh, target. The ball itself is coming up and over, and it defines a line that is on the right side of the target. And now he's throwing it down this tunnel. And that's what I mean by framing the throw, okay? And if you step your left foot at the crotch or at the middle of your target, you're cutting your hips off, the power that you can create with your hips. But by opening it up and framing the target properly, you're throwing your belt buckle out at them, you're using your left foot as a reference, okay? And now you've found your outer limit on the left and the ball defines the outer limit on the right and you throw it down this tunnel. So this is the last um, part of that idea. 
So that was that. Um, anyway, um, would you want me to talk about throwing on the run a little bit or how do you want me to progress? Yeah. If you got it ready, go for it. Yeah. I mean, I got a lot of stuff ready now. We could be here till five in the morning here. I'm just <laughs> saying. So if anybody, uh, um, anyway, I'll just talk about this and, uh, and, and let me just say this. <clears throat> Um, and Danny talked about it briefly. I just want to um, expand on it. Um, we, I never allow a quarterback in uh, Pascalton um, to uh, have the play expire and him stay there. So he's got to have – his feet are a window to his brain. When I watch his feet, I know how he's processing. And if I see him stop, um, I know he stopped thinking. And so the thing that I emphasize to him is that every play in Pascalton or every play in team has a possibility to be extended. Okay. Never sit on the ball in Pascalton. If your progression, if you've exhausted your progression, then you've got to move your feet and find your check down, or you've got to run to throw. You've got to keep your eyes up and you run to throw. And so right away, we don't have to do a separate period for scramble drill. I mean, we will get this maybe three or four times in a 40-play script of Pascalton, and then we can review it and teach it. So in effect, he is learning to throw on the run there. Now we do the drills, the throw on the run drills um, in our practice, in an individual, but the scramble idea and I've got video of this. Uh, the scramble idea is um, something that we um, emphasize in Pascalton. I never want a dead play. Okay. So anyway, when you're throwing on the run, and I'll talk about it from a very conservative perspective, perspective first. And um, he, Danny mentioned this. Um, the way to teach this is that you want to tell your guy, <clears throat> there are three phases to this and it's no different than just throwing from a natural position. And sometimes they get spooked or they get the idea. A young kid will think, Oh, I'm throwing on the run. I could throw that much harder, but no, not necessarily. Um, what you do is you break it down for them and you tell them the key thing here is to make sure that you're gathered. Okay. And so you want to leave the line of scrimmage and you want to sprint. Okay. And, depending on what type of scheme you're running, however you want to set up your sprint game, you may want to put a cone right here. And for me, I usually set it, if I'm doing our sprint out that I've taught, I, I put that cone at about six to seven yards behind the guard. Okay. And then from there, you know, I'm telling them, this is a sprint, two hands on the ball and you're uh, Jesse Owens. Okay. Or Usain Bolt right here with your eyes downfield. Okay carrying the ball in a nice, comfortable position. From here, we are now turning and we are gathering. We are getting our feet underneath us. We've still got our eyes over here to the target. We have another cone, and it, again, depends on how you set up your launch point. But now once he reaches that cone, okay, now he can start to attack. And so from a very conservative perspective, um, this is how you would like it to, to end up in a game. You have a sprint phase, a gather phase, attack phase, and that's how you should teach it. And what Danny said, which is true, if, if you throw it on the attack phase, you end up, um, if you do this drill, um, you end up uh, running to your target and your momentum carries you to the target and your receiver hands you the ball back. Now, this is the way to start it, to teach it initially, but it never ends up like that in a game. And I'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, if you're throwing to the right, okay, uh, I've set up cones here so that you can see that he's going to uh, open up at 45 degrees. He's got his first cone here. And now I've specified a number of steps. And that was based on the scheme that I was teaching. Okay. And I set up a second cone here and um, now he's attacking. Okay. Now, if you're going to your left, it's a different story. The angle of departure was deeper, okay, 60 degrees. And the key reason for that was we needed to clear our left, uh, our right hip. We need to get our right hip out of the way. And this is the analogy I use. You're going to be like a shortstop now. 
who's who's running to second base to pick up the the, the hot grounder okay, between himself and second base. And then you've suddenly got to get your hip around and get the ball to first base. And it's a lot like the Derek Jeter throw that I had had shown you. But that's the idea here is that he's got to get a little bit deeper so he's got a little bit more time to clear his hip and then get to your target line. And so that's rolling to the left. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes, like Coach said, you're not going to get this phase here. This is a very difficult scheme to protect for. Okay, you've got a running back maybe that's going to secure the edge, but he's got a scrape linebacker that's running through his face, and he's going to get pushed back right here. And oftentimes you're going to have to make a throw that I call catawampus. Okay, you're, it's one of those throws that is, um, you know, you're, it's not anything like you teach, and you're going to have to throw from a very awkward position. And if you ever get a chance to watch Tom Clemens' video, he was one of the best at being able to disengage his feet, his legs, from his throwing platform. And he could throw from many awkward positions. Incredible. Just incredible. With good velocity. And it took practice. Um, anyway, so this is where that kind of stuff uh, comes into effect. So anyway... Um, that's the idea of rolling out and throwing on the run and how you can teach it. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about any of this. I put them all to sleep. If you have any questions, guys, just go ahead and unmute and, and ask away. Hey, Coach. Uh, Coach Barizzi, I have a couple of questions that might seem uh, slightly off topic because you covered so much stuff now that I'm going back a bit earlier in your presentation. Yeah. Is that all right with you? Absolutely. So my first one was um, uh, about, so kids these days, they, they're good at watching their own film, right? They watch themselves, yeah. they, they're used to it, right? How do you go about teaching them, especially young guys coming into U sport, for example, for my uh, for my okay. purposes? How do you teach them to watch oppo film? I uh, watch what film? Uh, opposition film, you know, to watch the opponent yeah. and prepare for that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I had a very captive audience because I paid those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I found I was I was giving them a summer job, basically. And part of the summer job was this is it. I, the other part to that was I just had very good. I had one kid who I mentioned to you, he said to me that uh, he wanted to be a pro. And so once he said that, then I had him. And then, you know, the thing was, he set a good example for the other kids. And so for a few years after that, I was very fortunate. Okay. Um, and even when I finished, I was very fortunate. Those kids really, they bought in and, um, you know, I, the, the thing that we were able to do is I, I was able to try to keep it fresh for them. And, um, um, you know, without getting into a lot of concepts, but explaining a lot of things that were happening. And so the, the big thing was to be able to um, show them something new all the time and just to try to capture their imagination. And, you know, by opening up a line of communication, the thing that I, that really got was a hook for me was I allowed them to tell me what they liked and then we would do it. And when they got success doing that, which we did several times, I don't know if JP Aslan's on here or Chris Colson, but I know in one Panda game, I had like four suggestions on a sideline and they all turned out to be zingers. You know what I mean? And the kid, one kid, he came to me and he said, coach, remember we talked about this in May and, you know, we saw this coverage and we were talking about it. And, and I said, yeah, you're right. They're doing it, aren't they? And he said, yeah, we can do this. And so he had, he was, he had authority. He had that. And that really, that really gave him, um, you know, he was pounding his chest, not because he threw a touchdown pass, but because it was his play that he made up there on the spot in a critical moment. And, um, you know, the other kids too, there was three other kids that came to me with zingers, you know, and that's when it became fun for them. And so you got to, that was one hook that I had. And um, uh, yeah. And then, you know, the, the other thing was just being able to um, show them, like I would always show pro video 
and show them how it related to what they were doing. And I was always able to get bowl games. And so they always wanted to see, you know, what these guys were doing. And um, I mean, I was lucky. I had some really, there was a couple kids that couldn't do it. It was hard for them to do it. I had to be careful what I asked them to do. You know, they were really stressed for different reasons. The parents were great with some of them, you know, cause they really supported the cause. And so, um, uh, you know, they put less strain on them. They were able to help them with their schooling. So that was a big thing. And so, um, yeah, but I did run into the situations where, you know, and I had to understand it was difficult for me because other kids set a high standard, but I had to understand that I had other kids who were, um, hand to mouth, basically that, you know, it was tough and they had jobs and commitments and schooling and you know how that goes. So I was lucky. Um, I mean, I always wanted to recruit the kid that was rich and stuff like that, but you know how that is. Absolutely. I. Uh- did you bring up the Panda game because I played for Carlton? I mean, is that a no, singer? No, 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 no. You taking a singer at me? No, no, not at all. Not at all. It, it, it's good. actually, it's actually happened, and um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, these kids came to me with plays on the sideline, and you know, I'm I'm big into the. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story. The um, well, you know this, the the guy that invented the um, our telestrator, the um, Tunch. Uh, you know, he was one of our guys and he invented, he, not that he invented it, but he got it and all the CIS teams are using it. The so, game strat. Yeah. <clears throat> game strat. Thanks. And I don't know if anybody realizes, but uh, anyway, I was fiddling with this thing before he ever came up with this idea. And I was really struggling with it. And he's an engineer, this kid, and he played on our team and um, he, uh, He's working. He sees me struggling. He says, coach, I can make that for you, you know? And so he does this thing. He makes it. And um, we were playing an exhibition game at Montreal and then it breaks down and I'm like, I'm freaking livid. And he's about to run out on special teams. I said, you know, you got to fix this right now. He said, no, I'm on special teams. I said, never mind that. Fix this right now. You know what I mean? Anyway, I'm big on the game strat sideline thing and looking for that. And the kids were too. They were really, uh, they saw a lot more than I could see. And um, I, you know, I was lucky. I had a really good group of kids, very, uh, you know, intelligent kids. And um, that, that was a very fortunate thing. I agree with you on the game strat. The kids see a lot. Uh, you know, you're busy kind of managing the game and stuff. They, yeah. they really can get into it and watch the play. And they, I find the, the backups too really help the starter yeah. kind of navigate through it. Well, tremendous. Well, yeah. Like our backup kid that we had, he was a gem, just a gem, you know, just that wasn't going to ever be a great player, but he just, he just bought in he was one of those kids that came in my office afterwards. He had about 20 notebooks, you know, just impeccable writing, everything. Remembered every little detail, just to, you know, never forget that guy. Yeah. So my second question, if you allow, uh, I guess I'm the uh, designated quarterback coach question. Um, So how do you feel about, you know, quarterback competition at every camp resetting versus, you know, naming your guy kind of early so you can, you know, yeah, you know, devote Uh, more reps to him. Yeah. Um, You know, and I, um, well, you heard my story about being at central Florida and how that was. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I, uh, I, I kind of made a mistake. I had a really good kid and I didn't recruit another guy. You know what I mean? And then um, he graduated and I was kind of left stranded. And in hindsight, I would rethink that proposition, you know, and I would make sure that a second guy got reps. Um, I was really, I was really tainted by my experience at central Florida, you know, Uh, and um, even in the CFL, like we'd get 12 play pass skeleton. It would be nine plays for the, um, 
the starter and three for the other guy. And so uh, it was a real struggle for the backup. And I kind of live with that. And um, uh, when I had the one kid, he became, he was really good. I, I didn't really pay much attention. I lived on a thin line. Um, you know, this year I saw something that McMaster, I was shocked that they did it, you know, and I give them credit, you know, cause they came through spring practice. They had a really tight competition. I knew the two kids and he just told the, 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 the guy they determined would be second, just told him you may as well transfer now. And I saw how that worked out for them. And it was, it worked out really well because they didn't go to camp with the controversy. You know what I mean? There was no, um, no question who the leader was. And, uh, you know, they, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It just worked out for them. And, uh, I, I, I'm not dodging your question, but no, no, I, I get it's a hard, it, there's no, hard, and I think it's, it's specific to the, the, the team and the situation. And I can see the advantage of what they did. You know, um, I was at Penn state where we, we had, you know, it would go right until, um, August in well into August before it was declared. And it was, uh, that wasn't easy. That wasn't easy. And the thing about it was when it was made, the decision was made. Now you're dealing with um, uh, this player who was right in the midst of it. And now he's, it was hard for him to adjust and that affected the locker room and they didn't have a lot of time to adjust because now they're going right into the, you know, game week. Whereas what they did at McMaster was it all settled in, if you know what I mean. Uh, they made the decision. I'm not sure when, but it was about this time of that season. And then they had the rest of the summer to adjust. And I don't know all the parameter, all the things that were going on there. So I have to be careful. I just look at it from outside and see certain advantages that, that happen. Thanks coach. That's uh that's uh, that's uh, that's helpful. I mean, again, it's a it's a difficult question. It's you know we all want to get our starter kind of more reps and stuff, but uh, you know I feel you got to give everybody the, a fair chance. But you know you go into a 14 day camp before your first game. How much you know in reality? How much time can you can you have a true competition? You know, right. so it's it's difficult. Yeah, and uh, you know with your training camp being what it is. I'm sure it's short, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. And maybe that's something that Coach Potasic was thinking about at that time, too, that he considered. Uh, yeah. And the one advantage of having an open competition is they're going to be battling it out during the summer. It may push. And it, that's another parameter that you don't know or that I don't know. Um, you know, what is the nature of their character? How are they going to be? you're going to hand them a million dollars. How are they going to deal with this million dollars? You know, are they going yeah. to spend it foolishly or are they going to capitalize on it? Yeah. All right. Thanks coach. Yeah. Did I put them all to sleep, Paul? Did I, I, uh, I have a, I have a comment here. Uh, it's, it's more a uh, coach. Barisi is more of a, a testimony and actually a question, but, I was at your spring practice, uh, I oh, think it was geez. spring of 2020, Ooh. at 19, I, I, I forgot. But my point is, I really like your point about your how quarterbacks should behave and, 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 um, and just be themselves in a certain manner, because I'll never forget that. And we're still talking about that with our daughter. She, uh, your quarterback, Matt Mulder. Yeah. I'm standing there, uh, you know just learning a few things, asking you questions and just going through the thing. And Matt just came up to me and says, Hey, uh, Matt put his hand out, give me a nice firm handshake, put me right in the eye. And I just shook his hand and said, Hey, looking good. And he just went on to his practice. And that was my immediate thought going, my God, this is a leader. This is a guy that took time to take this. Yeah. Well, it wasn't we don't know just standing there. And uh, he took the time to come introduce himself and, I could just feel from his handshake, his eyesight, I said, this guy's a leader. And it, 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 it's a testimony, Coach, to what you said, how you, how, you, how you behave as a quarterback is different.
from, from any other position. So, yeah, well, Matt had a lot of natural. He's he's going to be a, a CEO someday, and it won't be because of anything that I ever gave him. I'll, I know that he's a he's a great kid. But thanks for saying that. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. It was totally. I I could see it right through your slides. I mean, I lived it. I lived it myself. I was standing there by this guy with arms folded and just came over. Well. Impressive. I, I will say this, though, and um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed my time as a head coach. And the one thing, um, uh, you know, I, I got from different coaches that I worked with and I tried to do it with the guys I had is when, when we recruited, I mean, I would raise hell with a kid if if that kid saw me on campus with a recruit and he didn't come over and introduce himself and say who he was. Or if he saw a parent of a recruit, and if he didn't come over and introduce himself, that to me was, um, you're going to be um, getting a strongly worded letter from my office the next day. Uh, this, let me put it that way. And so, um, but Matt was, he's a special, uh, yeah, he'll be, a, he might be vice president or of the USA or president or prime minister or something. I don't know. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, though. Welcome. Coach, I uh, wanted to ask you, you talked earlier on in your uh, presentation, you talked about kind of those remarkable abilities that uh, you look for in quarterbacks. I'm just curious your thoughts on how much of that type of thing is innate versus how much of it can be coached or taught. Well, what I was referring to there was their ability to take in information, um, perception, okay, and um, make reactions. And like what I mentioned there was like, if you're driving a car, you are, you, everybody is going to be able to react to danger. You know, if suddenly a car jumps out in front of you, you're going to foot, put your foot on the brake. So everybody has that ability. And I feel um, a, a lot of people, you can train a lot of people to do the things, the basic things that a quarterback needs to do. OK, which is basically react to danger. Now, will they have the athletic ability to get out of harm's way? Will they have the athletic ability to drive a ball into a six inch spot? OK, um, how innate is that going to be? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's for me, my, my, my point there was and what I based all of my philosophy on in terms of practice was getting that guy as much, as many reps as possible, um, making it as automatic as possible. Um, and I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I think it's trainable, um, but I have to put, if he's driving the car, I have to make sure he's trained properly. And I, when I ran the program that I ran, I did it maybe at the expense of a lot of players because the quarterback was the catalyst. Everything was geared. All of practice was geared to make that guy better. You know, defense, you're going to need to show us this today. Offensive line, you're going to need to do this today, et cetera. And so um, maybe that was to a fault, but that's how, you know, I saw, I spent all of my time, you know, getting that guy ready and um, trying to protect him. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I guess the basic thing I'm saying is I tried to train them as best I could to develop these abilities. Yeah. Thanks coach. I, I think that's kind of the, the, you know, the thing that we've all run into is we've seen the guys who have all the technical abilities. And then for whatever reason, you just kind of don't believe in them. You don't believe they're the right person. I think we've all kind of seen those kids before they look great in drills. They could throw yeah. the ball biomechanically. They look solid. And for whatever reason, they don't seem to have the intangibles. And I think that becomes a tough thing as a coach figuring out, like, you know, is this the guy we're going to ride with or not? You no, know, I, I had to make some tough decisions on some kids that were really talented. I mean, really talented kids that could really throw the ball. But the thing about it was, you know, he wasn't Sergeant York. And we had Sergeant York sitting behind him. And um, the kids kind of knew it. The kids kind of um, felt it. And I could feel that they felt it. Um so that really, you know, once the decision was made to kind of cut the offense in half, but I felt better that I had a, 
a good driver in in place. So I understand. I mean, if you're coaching long enough, this happens, right? Yep. You got a uh, question here from the chat. Tyler's unable to unmute and ask it. Um, so Arians has been talking about giving Brady less reps during training camp, uh, but making him stand behind and coach up whoever's in. What are your thoughts on this idea? Well, um, again, uh, I, I brought up this, the thing about um, – uh, Dave Dickinson and I, I was coaching Danny McManus in his last years. And, um, it was hard for Danny. Um, I mean, uh, I, I really dreaded the situations when we might get into the fourth quarter of a game and the other team puts on a long five minute, six minute drive. Cause Danny is going to stiffen up, you know what I mean? And, um, that's just the way he was. He was 39 years old at the time. And, um, um, and so, you know, we made sure that we got him his reps early and Dave Dickinson was basically a little bit more athletic or um, I don't, I don't know how to say it, but um, he could um, stand around at practice, but he didn't need a lot. And I, I get the sense that I don't think Tom Brady would probably need a lot either after seeing it so many times. And um, I wondered I, I didn't hear this quote, so I kind of – I don't know Tom Brady, but I just read a lot about how he never likes the backup to get reps, so I wonder how he feels about that. So, I mean, one thing might be that he wants to just save his body. I, I know when um, I was coaching Danny, uh, I did a pitch count. I used to carry a pitcher's uh, umpire's thing – in my pocket and we would never let him get beyond 60 throws in a practice. And that was the limit. And we kind of agreed on that. And so, you know, there's wear and tear that's happening now. So that might be a factor too. I, I don't know. So is that, would that have been a mutual number you guys came up with? That yeah. Yeah. Felt- when we, we talked about it and um, uh, he may not remember that, but I remember it distinctly. And um, uh, that's what we did. So, and it was, uh, you know, we'd give him a few. Th- the thing about it was, um, you know, warm up. Um, a young kid will need, like, I have five phases for a warm up, and they, uh, you know, they'll need to go through all of that. With a guy like Danny, it was like three or four throws, and he was ready to go, you know. So that would be, you know, the other limit would be about eight throws for the warm up, and then maybe um, routes against air. And, you know, the thing was, he was, he was incredible, you know. You'd bring Danny out in the field. An American kid would come on to come up and try out for the team. And you'd bring him out on the field and you'd ask him to throw the out to the far sideline. And the kid would look at you like you're crazy. And then he'd see Danny come out, this old guy, just freaking zip it and rip the guy's hands off, you know, 42 yards away on a line. And the guy would be, the kid would just, I'm never going to do that, you know, but that's what. Danny was kind of exceptional that way, but uh, yeah, that was where, that was our outer limit for him. So. Excellent. Anybody else have any questions? Just go ahead and unmute. Otherwise you can just jump right back in coach. Do you mind if I show a concept? I I mean, I put together about 30 concepts. Pardon me? Let's jump into a concept. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's some things here that I, uh, yeah, I, my, my, uh, DV sports stuff, it just blew up on me, but I, um, uh, it was really good for me to do this, uh, cause I was able to pull out a lot of stuff and, uh, I, are the Carlton guys on here? Uh, let me see. All right. I shouldn't say the Carlton guys now. I, that's not right. Um, uh, yeah, they're uh, Colson. I mean, so- formerly, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't. Mean that. I'm, that's really bad. You got a bunch of formerly ones. You got, uh, well, I'm a former myself. Former, former players too. Um, let's see. Okay, so what's my sequence here? It's yeah. It's still on your power your PowerPoint now, so you'll have okay, to. So, um, I'm going to do a new share. Yeah, stop share. And then. Uh, what do you see now? 
Yeah, there you go. You got your DB okay. scores up your uh, home screen. This will go up in a second. Okay, um, so we called this, um, I have it written up. I, I don't have it written up and inserted here, but I'll explain what we're doing. It's a two-play, can you see it? Yeah, we got the scoreboard there. Okay, so it's a two-play combination, and we called it cheers. So all we had to do was say cheers, Okay then everybody knew what to do. And so the first thing that we were going to do, the first play that we were going to run was an outside zone play to the right or to the boundary, rather. We're going to be in a 41 formation, and we're going to run an outside zone play to the right here, okay? And we're going to have all these receivers on the left side run over, okay, and get set up really quick. So I'll be honest with you, I'm really not too concerned about the outside zone play here. We didn't block it very well, but now we're, we're just, uh, everybody's running over and they just set up automatically. And you can see how the defense is scrambling Okay, and then we run three verticals with a hitch. And um, anyway, I, we did it more than one time. So this is Matt Mahler here, coach, number 17. Awesome. Yeah. So same idea. We're going to run the outside zone play um, to the left. And you can see we're telling our receivers to, you know, get across the field and then as if you're going to block there and then get set up in a diamond shape to the boundary. And you can see their, their boundary or their field half is really scrambling to get it lined up into a 14 against a 14 alignment. Ooh. So then this, this is why I asked about the other guys, the Carlton guys. We have kind of a choppy film here, but um, anyway, we're doing it here. So now we got uh, our four receivers lined up to the boundary, and they're they're struggling to get lined up. It's happening so fast. So we did this every time we did it. It worked out pretty well. Anyway, the Sam and the half, we're still looking on. They're still, yeah, they're stuck. Yeah. And it's not just that team, but uh, anyway. On this one, you did it to the field coach on that last clip, right? No, no, no. We did, okay, it, okay. We did it to the boundary. The, um, the uh, whatchamacallit on this, um, we had a really bad time with this video and it didn't okay. think properly. Um, yeah, the, the tight and the wide don't line up properly, right? Right, yeah. 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 So um, I don't know what else. I mean, I've got a whole bunch. I don't know how you guys feel, but anyway. Coach, that uh, the, the second play in the series, I mean, obviously going 1-4 is a problem for a defense in general, let alone if you do it really quickly like that. Yeah. Were you running that regardless of down and distance? Doesn't matter yeah. what you got on the first play? Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't matter. We're doing it. We're, we're going. 
you know? Yeah. So like if we ended up with second and one or something like that, yeah, we were, we didn't have an abort signal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And we weren't the way we were running the ball. We weren't going to get, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. That's not right. <laughs> anyway, I was, I was really looking forward all the time to the second play, you know, and just, you know, let's get this over with and let me see how they're going to react to it. And I'm, I'm looking for the field half and I'm looking for the Sam and I'm looking for the free safety. Often the free safety is throwing a fit, you know, he's yelling at guys and uh, yeah. Anyway. I don't know what you you would need. You want some more or what? I mean, yeah. Throw up another. Throw up another scheme. Okay. Uh, let me see. Oh, you got any uh, clips of your screen where none of the old linemen move? The throwback screen. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the one against you guys. Um, and um, and I don't know why I don't have it, but this is against Western, and our running back makes a mistake here. So the idea, first of all, is uh, we just called this call. This was called Cogsworth. Not that it matters, but we are going to um, everybody's going to delay except for the uh, uh, the quarterback and the uh, the field side running back and the field side receivers. But the line is going to start just stay. And so the running back makes a mistake and he outruns the lineman and he just, he's got to stay behind these guys. But I, you know, I guess I understand, right. Cause the lineman, <laughs> I mean, this is probably the most they ran all season on this play. And we really should have called it um, maybe at midfield. I'm sorry, I don't have the end zone shot on that. That's too bad. Oh, here it is. So you guys may not like this, but I would tell the offensive line, just block them like you normally do. Just let them come in. <laughs> I'd love to be in your install meeting when you're explaining this to those guys. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I picked on those guys too much, but anyway, um, yeah, so that was, uh, something, um, here's another thing. Uh, this is our inside zone play. So this play had, uh, basically four or five options on it and it's inside zone and we have, um, inside zone going this way with all the rules here. Um, I don't want to get into how that's going to happen, but we're basically going to handle the five down to the point of attack. Our uh, number three receiver is going to handle the perimeter right here. Um, and if that guy um, comes, we're going to run a bubble. Uh, we have basically a gift throw over here. These guys are running hitches. I don't know why I ever got out of this play. Um, this play was really good. You could, you notice that this was done at Queens before they set up the new stadium. So, I mean, we did this a lot back then. And so the quarterback's got about, uh, well, he's got another option. There's four options here. So um, in this case here, the, the dime guy comes. And so we throw the bubble. And if you keep doing it, the quarterback really gets comfortable with this. He's got, again, a lot of options. And you'll see as we go along. So in this case, now he decides to give it. And, um, you know, we had a, a kind of a, a intricate call at the line of scrimmage um, to tell us what kind of technique our tackle was going to use. In this case, this was easy for us because, you know, we're coming to here. 
here, you know, with these two, all we had to do was read this. It's very simple read for us. Okay, just read one. If this guy had bumped over, then we would have had to read two, but this would have been a simple read. He took an upfield charge, and uh, we were able to get it behind him. So here we take uh, – uh, we he pulls it. He could have thrown it down here at the bottom. we would have made what we call an arrow call. He should have gone right for that shoulder there to pin that guy and just leave the quarterback with that one there. Uh, I don't know why we did the shuffle like that. So now he has a chance to take the easy throw to the boundary and he can make this decision obviously before the snap. I mean, he's got softness out here with a press on number two. So, it's a gift throw. It's something that he knows he's going to complete or he should complete. Coach, are you, are you always rock throw on your, uh, on your quick game and you're just using the same footwork here? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, he's got to let the, in this thing here, he's got to let the back clear, right? Okay. So, I mean, that's we're running this play for the line and the running back. They're thinking run all the way. He sees a chance to um, throw outside. He's got to get out of the way here for the running back, right? There's no – basically, there's no call to the running back. He doesn't know if he's going to get it or not. Yeah. So, um, the quarterback has to kind of drop away. This time we get, we get a skip ball. But again, he had, you know, we're running double hitches to the boundary and he really had an easy access throw there. Now this time they're leaving the way they adjusted. If you watch this from the end zone, it's basically a five man box. So no matter what happens outside, aside from a blitz, but that should be an automatic give. And really what should have happened here was we should have had a turnout to that guy there. He's removed and we should be out. We still end up with, you know, a decent gain. Okay, so this is another part of this now that, um, you know, Queens, because they play this 40 front, we felt we could do this. Um, if ever there was the, uh, the B gap open, we were going to make a follow call. And so he would just say follow. And that would mean that he's going to block here, going to go there. We prefer if he's in the A gap, but it worked out okay. He's going to go right to here. And he's going to take the fake and go and block that. And then it's the follow for the quarterback. Looks like I'm picking on Queens here, doesn't it? I don't mean to do that, but... Let me ask you this while we're watching. You, yeah. drilled a, you drilled a slide with them, or you kind of hope that they're, they're natural at it? I, I don't drill it. I just tell them, you know, to protect themselves. Um, you know, don't be a hero. I, I don't – I haven't drilled it. This was at, at practice. He 
You really should have thrown the uh, alert here. We've got a dime pressure off the front side. So that follow is an automatic with an open B gap? Well, we give it, you know, we'll, we'll talk to them and say, look, you're going to get a lot of these this week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it may be like there's some, like playing you guys, Carlton, the way you used your front, we said, look, at, you're not even considering follow this week, right? Because your guys were always, um, well, what do you call it? Floaters, basically. Uh, when I say that, they're, they're never really lined. I mean, Greg Marshall will give you a 40 front static. You know, it's very rare when you play Carlton that you would get a static front. So we just wouldn't emphasize it. I don't know if that answers your question. We rarely yeah, no, have that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Just didn't have the. Depends on how dynamic the defensive front is, basically. Yeah, I mean, there was no point in repping it. We're not going to get, a, you know, the wide open gap. You're never going to be certain. So this week it's off. Anyway, that's I think you get the idea there. Um, anyway, I don't know what else you want to. There's a ton of stuff here. So if anybody ever wants to talk ball, just give me a call. <laughs> well, that was awesome. Uh, if, if anybody has any questions, like I said, just go ahead and unmute uh, and ask away. Um, I think we've kept you now for a little while going on in coach. So uh, unless you had something that you wanted to jump into for sure and, sh and show us, go for it. Yeah. I mean, the coach was talking about scrambling and um, yeah, th and this guy here is going to be pretty good. This kid, this uh, miracle. He, I mean, he uh, he's got ability. He, he's, you know, not a great throwing motion, but he, he's, he'll run a 4-7, and, um, you know, Coach was talking about playing other sports. He's never played another sport. We played basketball with these guys, and it was awful. Uh, I should have I played myself because these guys really had no open court sense. But even still, he's, um, he's got ability, and he's a big kid, and he can move. Anyway, this, I was really happy to see that he could do something like this because it took a long time for me to get him to keep his eyes up and even to run after uh, or step up. Uh, Derek, I mean, you guys did a great job, uh, Chris and JP, with Derek. I mean, he had a lot of uh, stuff going for him. When I say that, in terms of recruiting, Oh, that's a couple of Belleval boys you're talking about there, eh? Oh yeah. But this is um, this is a drill that you can you know you watch and you take this for granted. But this happens ten to twelve times a game, where he's going to step up, and he has to find a guy, and you know, kids don't really realize the little nuances that are involved here. But this is a very soft touch that's very accurate. And if it's a throw that twists the running back, um, we don't get the yardage. It puts them right in stride. It makes them be a runner. And uh, it's a fine skill. It's very um, – it's not uh, easily um, recognized. Same idea. He, he goes through his progression, doesn't really like it, and then he starts to run to throw, gets his heads up, Kind of helps too when you throw it to Bryce Vieira. That kind of helps as well, right? Yeah. Oh, the guy's—he's uh, unbelievable. And this is what I'm talking about: being a pocket athlete. You, you notice he's not really—he Derek is a very good athlete, but this doesn't take a lot. And just by you know knowing where people are on the field, it's very uh, very helpful. This is uh, Ben again.
And, you know, as a, as a coach, um, I can't call everything perfectly for these guys. And when you have a guy that can do this, um, it makes life a lot easier. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be right all the time. And I'm sure you guys, if you're coaching long enough, you realize what this means for you. You've just picked up another set of downs. Anyway. I'll put one more thing up and I'll just make a point. Is is Ted still on here? Probably got him. Yeah, yeah, coach, yeah. go ahead. Well, this is, I mean, I did a lot of uh, empty protection. And um, as a result, I mean, I'd had long discussions with our defensive coordinator. And what I told him, you know, I said, if you ever see, and he knew this already, uh, not that I needed to emphasize it to him. He was smart enough. But I just kind of reemphasized with it, it reemphasized it to him. You know, you, you see teams that play 33 and 42, which is really a big part of what I did. I said, you ought to just put six guys on the line of scrimmage and get a free player off the edge. Just do that. And because that'll really test the limits of your quarterback. He better know what's going on. And on top of that, the, the, the skill of being able to grip and, and rip it, he better be on top of that. And we found it was kind of hard to be able to do that. We thought we could put pressure on people. If As soon as they lined up in 33, our check was to go to a – to show a six-man with a flat top. And the first thing we were going to do was go after the guy. And then the next thing we were going to do was bluff it. And it really caused uh, – uh, I could show you video from our defense where it really caused some consternation for the quarterback. And um, it, it, it's difficult, you know. And um, anyway, uh, I, I came full circle on these protections. And <clears throat> I felt, you know, we're running 50 protection with the back scatting. And that's difficult for – this was difficult for our quarterback to handle. And I mean uh, Ben Miracle. It was a young kid. Um, Derek, not so much. He, he was, you know, a little bit more – uh, uh, advanced and maybe Ben will get it. But the thing I kept telling, I uh, kept thinking was just blitz an empty set because it's difficult for a quarterback to deal. Very difficult. And, um, but, as, but as a coordinator, wouldn't you knowing that, yeah. um, would you not build in? Um, Cause they can't cover the whole field with six other defenders. Well, can you, would you not build something in, yeah, because I'm sure there's an uncovered, like oh, like like, well, like that other play you had with those that hitches. It was a soft corner. Yeah, uh, but here's my point, Ted. I, I I deal with the quarterbacks and I do the drill every day where I, just like Coach Friend was doing, toss it to him and tell him to get the ball out quick. And it's not as easy as you think. And you put a kid, your fastest kid, on the edge, unblocked, and they get unnerved. You know what I mean? It may not be that he tackles the guy, but it could be that he's going to get hit within the rules, within the parameter of the rules. You know what I mean? Right. right. And so uh, and I said, I said that to our, our coordinator, go hit the guy because they're going to get spooked. They're not, there's not too many Tom Brady's here. You know what I mean? Right. In this league. And I'd always watch these kids. I mean, in this league, and not too many teams just do 33 or 42. And if they do, they have a real fast throw a lot of times. But, you know, that was one thing I, I just, uh, you know, I kind of came full circle on this thing. And um, I really started to uh, feel that the key thing for me to help this kid was to give him a protection that would be he could feel much more comfortable with. And that meant long edges. And, um, you know, almost like a seven or eight man protection, a right. lot like what you see Western do yeah. and, uh, Western, they rarely get into a 32 formation. And when they do, I know ourselves, we used to, we used to light them up with it because they, it's difficult to protect. It's really hard to protect. And it's not like something they do a lot. It's not like they train the quarterback 
to get rid of the ball, to understand hots on a 60 protection, for instance. It's right. difficult. Coach, uh, a yeah. question. Yeah. Regarding that empty and given that uh, you might be facing uh, a six up, uh, like I remember facing a five up and right. that sixth guy came from depth. Right. And it's he still got there. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but have you no, ever consider um, the shotgun going to six, seven yards? Have you ever done that? Where the no. quarterback is not at four yards and he's at six. I, no. Many times, I don't know if that. I, I, I'd be worried about how long it took the ball to get back there. I've not done it. I don't have enough experience with that. I'm just speculating. But um, uh, I haven't done that. Because um, I, I remember it was, a, it was a quarterback. Um, I forget, I'm drawing up. I, I'm forgetting the name now, but he was at six, was seven Damon yards, Allen. and then he dropped to 10 yards. It was Damon Allen. Ted, That's it, Damon Allen, telling, right. Really? Right. And wow. he would drop to 10 yards. So now, even untouched, yeah, there was he, enough time Yeah. for – uh, I haven't seen anybody else do it, but I remember well, watching Damon do it. Yeah, well, I watched him enough. I coached against him, and the thing is, the bugger would drive you crazy – because he's dropping back and then he's throwing the ball as he's dropping back, he's throwing it on a line accurately down the field. Okay. And which was an uncommon skill set. Okay. And you don't, you just don't get that. I don't know anybody in college at the U sport level that could do what he did. Right. I mean, he was so athletic and would throw from awkward positions with accuracy and strength. And uh, you know, yeah, I, I would, but I'm thinking more having that extra second because, you know, two, three yards, even yeah. if he's untouched, especially if, I don't know, the other, then the other topic that I would discuss with you after that proposal is, okay, do we want the free guy coming from behind him where he can kind of slide away from it and get another yard well, or two away from the first? You brought up step? a good point because the other, the thing that I would do was in, in tight the coordinator to make his check, show him an empty set. And then suddenly you bring a bomber in with a slide. You know what I mean? Sure. And now you're, you've got your secondary who is, they've got people on islands, which is really difficult. Okay. And then you've got front room clearance. Okay. Because you slid the protection um, and you've got a bomber that's coming in. You've actually, got a six man that's coming in from the backside and the add-in has to make a decision. And he's going to be, if your bomber is savvy enough to get there late and fast, then your, your add-in guy is not a factor. Correct. But if your Correct. bomber comes in and he's sitting there and he gives it away, now you have it. Now your add-in is a fact. Here's the seventh man. Right. And Cause many times on the flat top, they're at 10 yards away. Right. Or at the sticks, right? Uh, the, the 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 others that are not involved in the pressure. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but you've got these guys sitting on islands, and they're waiting to make. It, they're waiting to um, jump a quick out, for instance, or a slant. But now all of a sudden, um, it's no longer a one plus situation for them. It's they're 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 in one minus, and now you're running by them. And now you've got some front side room. And so that was my answer to that. And, uh, but still, I would still go after a empty set. I haven't seen anybody come up with that answer yet. Well, uh, I remember um, teams, uh, there was one team I remember, Sherbrooke, they line up with a flat top, like you said there, six across. And then the other guys at, at, at whatever, eight yards, 10 yards. Right. And they had, they would come or they would drop into uh, well, cover, cover three, double cut. Yeah. The, the dropout is a killer. Um, and I know it really, it does, I know it unnerved our kids. Um, and I'd have to try to explain it to them, you know, but it's not that easy. And then, you know, for your line to sort out who is it that's coming. And now suddenly your uncovered guy, you're, you have a guy who was covered and now becomes uncovered and he has to be ready to jump out and get the edge player. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, and that's sure. not, that's not easy. And, um, you know, you're dealing with kids on the offensive line that maybe not be the greatest athletes right. that can right. extend out and get this guy. You know what I mean? No, difficult. That's for sure. Well, anyway, um, I really started to like this protection 
because it's set up with a lot of runs and it's a slide with the backs coming to the edge. And um, this wasn't a good one, but uh, anyway. I was wondering what you might have thought of this. Uh, I, I like it when it when against teams that are like I'm uh, the Caravan used to come up through the double A, double B gap right. all the time. And sometimes they'd even drop the ends. And so I kept voting, I kept pushing the coordinator for this protection because if they're going to drop an end, they're probably dropping the end that the back is going to go block. You know what I mean? So, right. um, so we used to slide to the field you know, where Betts was, and then they were, if they were, uh, or, or Glau was, and when they would drop the, the boundary end, well, we had a back on him. Wow. It was perfect. This, this turns into almost, it looks like a play action protection that you would run off inside zone split, right? Like, it is, absolutely. And right here, I mean, we've got the running back aborting because he's, what's supposed to happen is um, he's stepping up to handle that edge over here. And then he's supposed to be right there with the fake, but because we've got a perimeter pressure, he aborts and comes right here. And, you know, we had a couple run plays that we really liked off of this action where, I mean, we're doing this, with these people and then he's winding it back with the ball and we get a kick out there. And then on top of that, we could leave the end. And this is the Western play where the fullback leaves the end, goes around for the linebacker and the quarterback makes a read off of this and he can pull it with a lead blocker in front of him. Yeah. You know, that was another thing that we liked off of this. So it set up a lot of things or was, this comes off a lot of things that we were doing already. The other thing, I mean, I, I, uh, I just like the uh, matchups that you can get outside and, you know, you get a big receiver and, um, you know, that can get downfield and you isolate them in a 31 formation, however you want to do it. And uh, yeah. It's another Matt Mahler throw for you there, coach. Now, Coach, because you were – I mean, you dabbled quite a bit, more than dabbled in empty. Did you go empty and motion back the back, you know, try to get stuff other than the bomber? Did you line up in empty, bring a guy back? Uh, what we did you – know, well, we did that, but what we did more was this. I'll, I'll show you quickly. Um, let me see that. Here. So we've got, um, I mean, we've got two people in the backfield right now and they scat. We did more of this, you know what I mean, to end up in 33. Yeah, so now he can't get into his empty check. That's right. Um, we did do a lot of uh, – um, adding in and, you know, uh, kicking out the back and then add in with a, uh, maybe a bomber or another back, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I mean, against those, uh, sting, you know, those sting teams, that's a, that's a killer. When you bring the bomber in and yeah. leak the back the other way, that, that causes uh, the defense a bit of problems. Right. Anyway. I better I better shut it down here, Coach. That's been um, well. Here, let me. This will be something. I don't know if Sharif will want this or not, but um, let's just do this. So uh, I was with Edmonton, and we did a lot of this kind of stuff where um, we were asking the quarterback to read a, adjustment to motion. And so what this took was a lot of um, formation study and motion study and trying to find out if they made the appropriate uh, reaction to motion. And so the quarterback had to know, did they respond? Here there's no reaction to motion, and we really get a, a, a 
a numbers advantage out here because these guys are high. He can handle that. He can handle that. Okay. And then we have a guy in the flat and he can read the perimeter, which is what we were trying to get him to do and just decide to pull it. If the perimeter, if the flank was empty or if we had good numbers, he was going to pull and throw. And so it meant a lot. It meant me going into the defensive coordinator's office and really trying to understand what motions would give the most problems in terms of support. How difficult would it be to handle support? And so, you know, you'd find some, by watching video, you'd find some obscure formation like this one, and you knew they were going to be stuck um, with the formation, first of all, and then really have problems with motion. And so, and then you're counting on your quarterback to make the decision whether to give or pull. And this was a really productive part of our, um, our offense. It really uh, got a lot out of this. And we'd always have different ways of trying to um, put a motion together that would give us an outflank situation. Yeah, they're spinning down more and more these days. Yeah, well, we had a they're great They're not bumping answer. as much or, or tracking as much. Yeah, we had a great answer for the spin. And um, right here, it's a late spin. And then we're giving it to a guy. You know, you try to design it to give it to a guy that knows what to do with it, right? And right. Um, it's an easy, you know, uh, you know, it's a – Sawyer is not a big arm, the quarterback, but he could certainly operate this. He knew what to do. And uh, it helped that the year before we ran the very same play and we got the same reaction and we missed the throw. And so we made sure that we, you know, we checked it out and we got it. And there it was. We got the blocks and the perimeter and um, anyway. But we had a lot of different ways to create leverage with, uh, with motion. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to get the ball into a yeah into a playmaker's hands. And let's just say, uh, you know, I had to stop Bryce when he was playing at Vanier before you got him. Uh, he he was good back then, even. Oh yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, uh, he was very dynamic. And again, this was great by Ben. I mean, he knows he's going to take a hit here, but he gets it out. Uh, give him credit. You'd like to see your guy step out of this, but uh... see, then the next thing that happens is what Ted was saying is they're going to start seeing this. And we did this against Western because they did it. They brought this guy down and we had a really good guy right here. And, you know, we got an isolation and, um, that would be our next answer. Yeah. But we had a lot of ways to do this. And it was great for a two-point uh, uh, scenario. I don't think our offense got 100 yards this game. We would have had a good one here. And again, we, I mean, we've used every game. We've had a different formation and a different type of motion. But we had a good flank here to go to. He makes a good decision. Um, you just got to train him to throw through a guy, which is not easy.
this formation, this motion here is one of the most difficult ones to handle because you uh, start in 23 and the boundary half, he's the guy, look at him right here. He gets stuck. He thinks this guy's coming back to him and then he gets stuck behind him and now he's late and we would have had a play here. We just, again, got to make the throw and you know, you have to train a guy to see through it. And obviously you have to spend some time, uh, you know, blocking on the perimeter. But we had good numbers there. We had them outflanked. Did you did you always package like a an action look off this? You know, off the same look where you, you now go vertical and stuff, or this was kind of a standalone deal. You mean in terms of throwing it to the flat? Yeah. Well, what we did, I mentioned, um, we started getting a lot of uh, um, spin, uh, yeah. Western particularly. So we basically we gave the same action and blocked the edge and let the you know this guy this half come down. And this guy run a post. The middle yeah, was wide yeah. open. Um, I mean, if ever you watch these things, I mean, my next step here would have been watch what happens behind them. When I say that, watch what happens uh, over to the field side. I mean, if you bring a guy across the middle here, mm -hmm. play. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not too much here, but a lot of times the other time you'd get a play there. That's nice too. Mounting flat, uh, you know, flat, uh, flat slant with it. That's pretty, yeah, pretty nifty there. Yeah, I mean the thing again, film study. You know, you watch it, you see the reaction and stuff. You see the holes, right? And then you just fit it accordingly. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at this one now, I know they're. They're given pressure here, but it, one of these receivers down at the bottom, you know, they're on islands here, right? And you've got a chance. And right here, he should have pulled and thrown. We had a pretty good surface to go to. Uh, he should have seen that. But you, you, you're going to get that. Again, like I say, I would have been looking for um, a protection answer, a motion, and a throw to the field. can't remember what the plan was this week i think we were just going to bring oh out of 31 yeah so that's what we did against uh, carlton see this would have been a great chance here i mean if you look at the receiver to the field the number two guy the way they play i mean they're such a um a cover three team right you've got a big voided area there on top of that you know, free safety sitting in the middle of the field, you've got a, a big chance for the X receiver here. Almost like you want to, at times, you'd think the backside of the spin would be would be an opening either for the X receiver or... Yeah, or well, that's when I'm, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because down, like I've heard down south defend defensive coordinators talk about why they want to do split field defenses is that they stay away from, uh, from spinning because mm -hmm. they find that in sp spin against spin, you could throw backside the, uh, down the seam or, yeah. or a one-on-one. -on -one. He no longer has the help. I believe it. Yeah. Replace the spin. That's it. Exactly. I mean, with so much spin going on now, uh, I've seen two, three clinics now by defensive guys, and it's like a with this motion, a late uh, motion in front of the quarterback by uh, by a wideout between the quarterback and the O line, not behind the quarterback, like right here in front of, like that's tough on them. They got to do something, and they for now they're doing a lot of spin, so replacing the spin might be something to look at. Yeah, for sure. 
Because if you're going to have an inside leverage, heavy inside leverage by those defenders that are left backside, then you're going to have outbreaks that you can easily uh, throw. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, I better, uh, yeah. Well, you got to keep it. stuff because we got you booked for uh, next January or February, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, this is one play that pissed off Laurier. You mean they got to talk to you after the game on the handshake? What, what do you mean? Well, we didn't line up properly. We put a receiver. We actually have our tackle playing right here. Okay, a little Bill Belichick we, stuff. Yeah, and we were supposed to have him lined up here. And we have a receiver right here. So they don't see it. Yeah, and, and the tackle goes back and look, he's going yeah. to – Belichick stuff. He's all, he's all fired up. He's all cranked up. <laughs> He's got to go back, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got to get a back pedal going. There. Yeah, he's all excited. They got called. We didn't get called because we only have six on the ball. Oh, uh, yeah. The tight end is uh, yeah, kind of open. Yeah. Anyway. Fun stuff right there. But now yeah. think about it the next week, whoever you played, they are spending a bunch of time in practice, you know, yeah. lining up the guys to that, communicating it or drawing yeah, it. I, I will say this. We did do it against other teams. And so they had, a, you know, they were looking for number two. Uh, I think uh, Dylan was number 23, if I'm not, I can't remember, but they're calling out his number. They know they got an eye on him. You know what I mean? So. But if they're working that stuff in practice, they're not going against yeah. you. Yeah, big stuff. So, yeah. plus from this menu that you have here, coach, you can have a couple per game and go for a couple of seasons. Yeah, well, you know, we'd have four ready per game. My thought, my the kids complained to me that we kept practicing and then never used them because there was a lot that we kept in our. I should have used them. We did use a, a few of them, but I had a lot more I should have used, and um, didn't do it. And anyway. anyway yeah. So they, they love that stuff though. And, uh, Hey, well, that's part of it is if they, they'll buy in, if they love it. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, there's part of it. Yeah. You let the tackle line up as a receiver, you know, Ta tackle eligible, throw them the ball. Huh? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was when I was in BC and you know, Dan Durazio, I mean, right. he, he recruited defensive players to play a, our goal line package was just phenomenal. And he recruited the linebackers to be the fullbacks and the tight ends. And he guaranteed each of them that they'd score a touchdown, yeah, you know, and they did. And that's in the season. And he was, you know, he's true to his word and um, they, they loved it. They just, they just embraced it all. So anyway, it's, it's, I should stop here, coach. It's uh, well, that was, that was great stuff. Um, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll the guys on the YouTube live. We'll let them go. Appreciate you guys jumping on. I know there's been uh, a bunch of guys on. There's 172 people clicked on at one point or another, and there's uh, seven people watching uh, still right now. So nice. thanks to all the people that jumped on. Um, the video will be available uh, once it's done. Uh, YouTube looking at it, it'll be available, and you guys can watch it uh, again later. So. Thanks a lot to all the people on YouTube, and uh, we'll cut that stream right now. There we go. Coach, 